can I welcome members who are participating by telephone conferencing this morning? <coughs> and this morning that is Orlea Flynn and Pat Sheehan, and that is in order to allow us to maintain the social distancing requirements. Can I thank uh, those members for that? Uh, can I also remind members about the protocol regarding the use of electronic devices? So we have no apologies, full attendance today. In terms of chairperson's business, I did want to brief the meeting in relation to uh, an engagement I done um, this week with a number of members across both of the islands, I suppose, representatives from the 26 counties, representatives from Scotland, Wales and England. It included my counterpart in Westminster, Jeremy Hunt, who, who was at the meeting, and the concept was around discussing the uh, imperative to, to move to a zero COVID. You do have the paper that was released at that meeting there in your packs, and we'll come back to it later in correspondence. Um, I think it was an interesting and a very, a very uh, relevant discussion in terms of, of the timing we're at. And I suppose the key kind of elements of it were that there needs to be maximum cooperation between the two islands in, in the sense of Britain and Ireland, but also that each of them are an island in their own right and should be taken steps at any given time to deal with the transmission or the virus in, in their situation. So I think in light of the, the uh, story that was circulating yesterday around um, the threat of, of spread of virus from people coming from England, I think it's very, uh, very informative in relation to that. But as I say, we will be coming back to that issue in terms of how we best uh, protect people here from further spread or increased spread of COVID-19, and uh, we can discuss that further in correspondence. Okay, what item is that? Just to get a read at it, um, the correspondence item. Do we have an item or a number for that? Is that, is that the document you were talking about? Yeah, it's 10.39, Pam. 10.39, uh, towards zero COVID. So, moving on then to the uh, draft minutes, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of June at tab 3.1 of the pack. Are members content with those minutes? Members content. Thank you, members. Is the matter rising? Uh, yes, Alan. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, just uh, at that meeting, um, uh, you had announced when we went live that uh, the, you gave a list of those who were in uh, attendance. Uh, and you listed two members who you had previously said had been going to the funeral. Um, so you, you announced them as being in attendance at the meeting, but the minutes reflect that they, well, they didn't appear during the meeting, they didn't come online, uh, and the minutes reflect that, that they weren't attending the meeting. But it just maybe it sounds like a pedantic point, but um, is it an order to um, confirm in live session that members are present? Uh, or when they're obviously they're not there? Um, well, I, 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 I wasn't, we couldn't see who was there, Alan. And I, I, whatever I said that, I presumed that they were there. I think it later transpired, and I did later say that they weren't attending the meeting. We do not require to be confirmation. I mean, if somebody's on the line, obviously you can't see them, but would there not be confirmation sought that, that they are there? And I think that was, I think you maybe did attempt to do that, but there was no response. Uh, but then when we went live, you announced that they were, you announced who was at the meeting and you announced the two names, but that, that didn't, actually didn't come to the meeting. Yeah, well, well what I said was that the, the members who are phoning in today by phone are, and that was my understanding. And when it became clear they weren't there, I made that clear as well. I'm, I'm not sure. I think if you check the, the, the video, I think you may see something different, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. Um, Item four then, I want to update members for the dwelling suggestion that we invite the junior ministers to brief us on the executive's decision making in relation to easing lockdown restrictions. Having taken advice, I can confirm that there is no barrier to the committee sending the invitation through, though any invitation has to focus on health issues and not stray into matters covered by another committee. Whether the junior ministers would accept or simply redirect us to the Minister of Health as our conduit to the uh, executive is another matter. I'd remind members that we have written to the Minister for Health to request detail of the scientific evidence on which recent decisions have been made. So any comment in relation to those matters? Okay, can I propose that we await the Minister's reply before deciding on our next steps? Okay, thank you members. 
So, moving in then, members, to our first item of uh, COVID-19 disease response today is a briefing from the Chief Dental Officer. And I can advise members that officials are here today to update the committee on the work of the department with regards to oral health and dental services. I refer members to the Clark's memo and other papers at tab five of your pack. So I'd like to welcome now by video link, Mr. Michael Donaldson, Acting Chief Dental Officer, and Mr. Paul Montgomery, Director of General Healthcare Policy. Um, so I'd just like to check uh, that you're hearing us okay there, Michael and Paul. Yes, uh, I, I just hear you okay. And Paul, are you yeah, here? You. Yeah, and we're hearing I'm you, here. Michael. And Paul, are you there? Uh, can you hear us, Paul? Yes. Okay. So I would now like to then invite the officials to go ahead and brief the committee, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just take you through the statement. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the impact of COVID-19 on general dental services. Dentists operate in, in the general, general dental services are independent practitioners registered to provide health service dentistry. They are separate from, from community dentists and dentists working in hospitals. There are currently 1,150 general dental practitioners in Northern Ireland, representing an increase of 9% since 2015, whilst net expenditure on dental services increased by 5.4% 5, 5 in 2019-20 to £105 million. Pounds. In response to COVID-19, it has been necessary to suspend the majority of dental care and treatment in Northern Ireland since March. This is in part due to the high risk that has been identified in respect of the need for aerosol generating procedures for many dental treatments, including fillings. In order to ensure that the more serious oral health conditions could still be treated, particularly those requiring an AGP, urgent dental care centres were established in each of the five trusts. Around 350 dentists from across Northern Ireland came forward to staff the urgent dental care centre rotas. In addition, dentists were still able to provide non-aerosol generating procedures to non-COVID-19 patients with an urgent dental care need. However, as time passed, COVID-19 indicators suggested lower levels of virus in circulation while at the same time, it was recognised that the restrictions were having a detrimental impact on population oral health. In response, non-urgent treatments not involving AGPs resumed on the 29th of June. This will be extended to include AGPs from the 20th of July, although some practices have been able to provide all dental services from the 1st of July. As services resume, it is necessary for dentists and their staff to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. This is to minimize the risk of coronavirus transmission during dental treatment. Although dentists normally source their own PPE from commercial dental supply houses, the availability of all types of dental PPE has reduced during the pandemic and costs have increased. In order to facilitate the resumption of non-urgent dental care, the minister announced last week that over 3 million items of PPE would be provided to dentists at no charge. Arrangements are currently being put in place to source and distribute this PPE to dental practices. In terms of financing, the financial support scheme was established at very short notice as a temporary measure to reduce the risk to the financial viability of the general dental service. The scheme provides an additional payment to eligible dentists each month based on the average monthly item of service payment they received in 2019-20. A similar approach and methodology has been adopted in other parts of the UK and here in Northern Ireland in respect of ophthalmic practitioners. There have been approximately 1,200 FSS each month. As a result, the total level of FSS and normal is made over the first three months of the current financial million pounds. This represents a 25% increase compared with the same period. Dentists have also continued to receive their normal allowance payments. The FSS payment calculation excludes the months in which a dentist received a maternity leave payment in 2019-20, as well as the remaining lowest month. In addition, a number of individual cases have been considered in detail and changes made where appropriate. There have also been amendments made for other specific groups, including dentists who have moved practice during the year or who are new to the workforce. 
where there was insufficient data, a temporary backstop payment was made to ensure an interim form of financial support was available. In order to support dentists as they resume non-urgent dental care, they will continue to be able to apply for the additional FSS support in July and August. For the remainder of the current financial year, the department will provide dentists with ongoing financial support within the available budget to support the delivery of dental care. From the wider, from the wider strategic perspective, the current oral health strategy for Northern Ireland took a considerable amount of time and resource to produce. The general thrust of the document is still valid, although the oral health of the Northern Ireland population has changed over time. In particular, children's oral health is now markedly better at the population level, although there remain oral health inequalities. In addition, increased life expectancy has meant that many older adults now retain their teeth, while in the past they would have received complete dentures. This is a genuinely positive development. However, providing dental care to older adults is challenging, so it is important that there are effective prevention programs in place. In response, the department has taken steps to constitute children's and older people's oral health improvement groups. These groups will become operational as soon as practicable, given the ongoing focus on rebuilding the health and social care sector. As part of these rebuilding plans, a new management board has been proposed. The Chief Dental Officer will provide advice where appropriate and will be represented on the board through the Chief Medical Officer. Assurances have been sought and received that the Chief Dental Officer will also attend the management board as necessary. The management board will take full account of all professional advice, including from the Chief Dental Officer. Thank you. Um, and are we hearing from Paul? Are you ready and content now to move to members' questions? Yes, yes, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that presentation, Michael. Um, we have been, the committee has received very, very late correspondence in relation to a meeting that took place yesterday and flagging up serious concerns around the supply of PPE and the ability of dentistry to resume services as outlined. What's your view on that situation? Okay, so the, in terms of PPE, as mentioned in the statement, uh, there are three million items which are currently being, the, the distribution process is underway and they're hoped to begin to be delivered to practices next week. So that PPE is level one PPE and level one PPE is adequate for non-aerosol generating procedures, which is what dentists can do at the moment under the current restrictions. So that will allow a very significant number of patients to be seen. We estimate around 38,000 patients per week based on information that the dentists themselves have provided to us in terms of their, what throughput is possible. So that, that will be a very significant advance from the position that we would have had previously where only urgent patients were able to be treated and we were looking at maybe 4,000 patients being able to be seen per week. That will help greatly in tackling levels of dental disease. I think quite possibly what what your uh, what is it underneath this uh, the, the issue that might have been uh, raised through the other meeting is level two PPE. So level two PPE, the BSO were asked about the possibility of supplying level two PPE at the same time as the level one PPE request was made, and it was not possible for the BSO to do that without possibly affecting the ability of the BSO to provide level two PPE to trusts and the wider health service. So it wasn't possible for the, P the BSO to arrange for level two PPE to be supplied to general dental practices. However, that is in part because the BSO contract with large providers and have a, a very stringent quality assurance process in order to determine that the PPE is appropriate. Practices normally don't liaise or don't work with these same large providers, they will work with dental supply houses or even smaller providers. So practices would be in a position which the BSO wouldn't be in to access level two PP themselves. So that, that, that is the current position that we believe that moving into phase, phase three of the rebuild of general dental services, that within the remuneration arrangements, there would be adequate funding to allow level two PPE to be purchased for some activity to be taking place in relation to aerosol generating procedures. Okay, and, and 
We did hear concerns from the BDA in relation to impending system failure. Very, very concerning. Um, can you can you assure the committee that that you are dealing with that situation? Uh, do you contest the fact that there could be an impending system failure as a result of these um, last minute arrangements? I'm not really quite sure what they mean when they say system failure. So I mean, we're we're looking at a situation at the moment where the figures from last week suggest that there were 11,000 patients seen per week. Compared to the approach that's been taken in other parts of the UK, the, the amount of care being provided here is, is, is reasonable. And we're, we're keeping on top of the, of the urgent cases, and that will remain the case. Uh, the PPE that's due to arrive next week will, will allow increased numbers to be seen. So I, do, I don't think we're moving from a situation where we are at the moment to something that's that's going to be worse. Uh, I think we can expect increased numbers of patients to be seen. So I I don't I don't quite understand how how they could describe that as a system failure. Okay, I'm going to move on to another issue because I think I think members may have other questions around that around that uh, correspondence. But I want to go back to the issue of the oral health strategy, which you said there was a lot of work put into. But has a lot has changed over time. Uh, that oral health strategy was uh, delivered or was produced in 2003, and I would I would suggest that a huge amount has changed over that time. You have indicated that that there has been significant uh, improvements in terms of oral health, but it remains the case I believe that three times as many children here in the north have extractions as would have in England. So given that the data and everything has changed over that period of time. Is it credible to suggest that the policy from 2003 is still relevant today? Okay. Um, I, I actually worked in the department at that time when the strategy was, was produced and, and was essentially the main author. And I can tell you that it was a considerable under, undertaking that took a long time and involved a lot of resources to, to get to the end point of producing the document, which uh, was actually, although the work had been going on for some time beforehand, the, the document was actually published in 2007. Uh, the position would be that the, the principles in the document are valid. Yes, I, I agree that oral health uh, in Northern Ireland has changed, and for example, among children, it's significantly better, but there are still oral health inequalities. So we still have the fundamental problem that there are some children whose oral health is considerably worse than average. And, and that's, you know, so the, the approach to dealing with that uh, is not dramatically different. Now, what, what is being proposed by the department is really a recognition that something does need to be done in terms of refining, refining the strategy, but it's not necessarily to go back to basics, not necessarily to go back to basics and spend a year putting together significant groups and, uh, you know, considering significant resources to get us to the end point. We feel that we can more efficiently get to the end point, and the work does need to be done. I think the debate here is really over the mechanism that we're talking about to get to the end point. Uh, the, the belief really, uh, you know, in, in the department and my belief would be we need to use the most efficient process to take us to where we need to be, which is looking at the approaches we can apply to, to children, children's oral health and older adults. And, you draw upon the experience that we have in Northern Ireland, you know, from general practitioners, community dentists, academics, public health dentists, to, to come up with the most up-to-date, best approach for, for tackling these issues. So it's it's really, I think we're, we're talking about two versions of the same thing. Uh, it's, it's just a more streamlined approach that the department is proposing to get us to the end point quicker. And given the urgency, Michael, and the... And the, and the uh... The inequalities that you reference, when can we expect to see that updated strategy? Well, sure. I, I, I mean, I think this is a problem which the whole health service is wrestling with. We, essentially, we, we, we are fighting a short term battle and a long term battle. And at the moment, I mean, I'm sure as everyone will appreciate, the short term battle against COVID is, is dominating our time. As, as soon as things settle to, to any extent at all, the group those groups, those oral health groups for children and older adults will be, will be revived because we're in the process of putting those together uh, back at the start of the year. They will be revived and that work, work will begin quickly. So it is, it's really just a matter of how, how quickly we can move to putting those groups together. 
given the other challenges, which which I have to say with COVID-19 are considerable. I mean, dentistry has been really impacted by COVID-19, I think, you know, as much as any part of the health service. So that is that is draining our, our time at the moment. But as soon as we have the time, we, we will do it. It is a priority. OK, thank you for that. And then finally, for me, before I go to members, um, we have heard uh, in relation to the management board that the your, your, the dentists are not sitting there all the time as of right on that board. And I suppose the concern has been reflected. While, while I acknowledge that you have told us that where appropriate, dentistry will be brought into the discussion. But if dentistry is not there, how do you know when it's, when it's appropriate or what it is that you don't know? Um, and if, if we take it that you know, dentistry are involved in things other than just strictly oral health, they're looking at, they're looking at uh, pre-checks for cancer and things like that. So as, as Chief uh, Acting Chief Dental Officer, do you not think there will be merit in having dentistry involved right, right front and centre? I think, Chair, sure, this, is, this is another question of uh, adopting the most efficient approach. So at, at, at the end of the day, there's a limited number of, of staff and time available within the department dealing with, with, dealing with dental issues. And the, the, the question is, well, what is the best use of the time of that staff? Now, I, I'm, I'm confident that the Chief Medical Officer uh, is, you know, is very well informed of dental issues and understands the relationship between dentistry and general health you know, in both directions, that when appropriate, he, he can seek my advice. Uh, or obviously, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a position to review the papers that are submitted to the management board. And if I see something that I feel there's a dental angle that needs to be you know, drawn to the attention of the chief medical officer, I can do that in advance of the meeting. So I, I think the mechanism that, we're, that, that we've got at the moment is, is the most efficient one to make sure that when there are dental issues or, or more general issues related to dentistry, they are flagged up, but without, without necessarily uh, the, the, the chief dental officer or the acting chief dental officer spending a, a, a lot of time on matters which, which are not directly related to dentistry. So it's, it's about efficiency in my view. Thank you. I'll move on then to members and I'm going to first of all Paula, then Alex, Colin, Pam and Arlea. I have an indication from on the on the screen as well. So Paula, please. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. My first question relates to the fallow time. Um, the a lot of the dentists have contacted me saying that they're very concerned about this one hour period post surgery that, that, that they have to stand down, which results in them only being able to work with seven or eight patients a day. Given the financial uncertainty and hardship that many of them have been under, they're very keen to see the scientific evidence upon which you have made that ruling. OK, so the, the, the fallow time uh, comes from the Public Health England uh, guidance. It's not specifically dental guidance. Uh, that has been followed UK-wide uh, in, in where any aerosol-generating procedure is provided. So. The Public Health England and their expert advisors are regarded as you know, the, the, the expert source for this information, and and, and we, we 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 follow that. Um, there there are I know uh, there there is an ongoing review among the, the the public health experts from the four countries into the fallow period specifically and aerosol generating procedures in general, and that is due to report very soon. I'm told so. We, we await that eagerly. I, I, I fully accept the point that the fallow period is uh, considerably uh, diminishing the throughput that is possible in practices. But at the end of the day, this is this is all to do with the balance of, of safety and, and reducing the, the risks of coronavirus transmission, while at the same time trying to uh, improve the oral health, deal with the unmet oral health needs of our of our population. And you know, there, there is sorry, nothing sorry, we can sorry. do. You're not actually answering my question. I've asked, where is the scientific evidence? Uh, uh, where, 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 have, uh, where have we seen that there is going to be a spike or, or this, this is going to cause more infections? We know that these are incredibly um, uh, places where there's, there's high, high gene control measures in place and there's other procedures that they can use that actually would minimise the aerosol um, generating procedures. So I'm just wondering about the evidence, not who told you. Or, or impose this upon us, but where is the evidence? Okay, so in a situation like this, we do not generate our own evidence. We, we will go to the UK experts 
and that that is where the evidence is so they they have looked at the best information available and i think it, you know a, a lot of people or most people would accept that this is this is a very dynamic situation so we're not talking about uh, you know years of research which has been done and repeated in multiple centers and everybody agrees that this is the position there, there is a variety of views but though, those who are at the uk level believed to be the the, the most expert uh, are, are, the, are those who are informing the Public Health England and, and that is the advice that we're following. Beyond that, the, 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 the scientific papers that they are reviewing in order, in order to produce that evidence, I, I don't have access to those. It's, as I say, this is, this is evidence that is applied or this advice is applied across the health service. This is not specific to dentistry. Sorry, do, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I have another question after. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just on the back of Paula's question, um, so w just for clarification, there there is no evidence, or the evidence hasn't been produced to date. Um, and on, on the back of that as well, uh, can you tell us where else in the world um, that is operating under those guidelines of one hour uh, follow time? Okay, so. No, absolutely not. There is there is evidence uh, that that is that is what uh, the, the, the the guidance is informed by. The, the question is, do I have access to that evidence? Well, at the moment, I'm not reviewing it. My my belief is that the expert committee are the experts, and that we have we have to go with their view. Now, as I say, this is under review at the moment, so it's not set in stone. Uh, as new information comes along, it is possible that the advice could change. But it, the, the advice is there for a reason. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's there to minimise the risk of coronavirus transmission. If, if the advice was ignored, there, there would be an increased risk of coronavirus transmission. So that, that they are the options. There's no, there's no risk-free option here. If we go down, if we you know, unilaterally decided that we're going to ignore the public health England advice, and we're going to go do something less than an hour. Uh, there's nobody that would say that that doesn't bring with it an increased risk. The question is, what is the size of that risk? Just, just before I go back, just yeah, yeah. as a follow up on this, on this, Paula. So, do, were you provided with the evidence, and do you have the evidence in front of you that was used to base that? Did you ask for that evidence? And also, given that we have, as I have previously alluded to, unique challenges and our own very, very worst situation. Why can we not take decisions based on the evidence ourselves? So, so we have devolved health here and devolved oral health, I take it as well. So first of all, are you in possession of the evidence that was used? And, all, and then what was your assessment of that in relation to our situation? Okay, so I think, I think there are two issues at play here. So we're talking about what, what the Public Health England advice is in relation to aerosol generating procedures and, and the fallow period. And that so that is the, that is the UK evidence. And you know I I, I, I don't question that. I mean I, I, you know reading around it, I, I, I didn't review the evidence that they the, the, the Public Health England reviewed in order to establish the, the, that position. But you know from, from my understanding of it, it's a reasonable position. Now, there is also then another issue which is given the very particular circumstances in Northern Ireland do do we look at uh, or we have altered uh, our approach to what general dental practitioners can do so that that is tweaked locally so in in every part of the uk each of the countries have have adopted a different approach in terms of when they have allowed uh, non urgent patients to be seen when they have allowed agps to be performed with the with the requisite ppe and when you know and the follow period is is constant across the uk but there is variation locally in the timing of when we move through the phases. So yes, that that is that is the local the, the, the local difference. But no, but nobody, no part of the UK at this point in time challenges the the, 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 the AGP advice from Public Health England. Although, as I do say, it is under review and the report is due very soon. So, you know, there, 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 things can change. Yeah, I think I, I find that incredible that nobody challenges the evidence. That statement from a chief dental officer, acting chief dental officer here, that no one challenges the evidence is wor extremely worrying, I have to say. But I don't even understand if you have seen the evidence, never mind challenge it. Okay, so so we're, we're talking about you know the, a, an expert group, a UK-wide expert group, 
who who have come to a decision based on the uh, on the information that's available. You know, I mean, they they are. We're talking about um, you know a particular type of skill here. We're talking about those who are experienced in you know viral transmission, those who are uh, you know understand microbiology, those who understand aerosols. This is a this is a very very particular um, you know area of expertise. There are many areas of healthcare where you, we rely upon the, the 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 expert view. It's it's not possible to to for for everyone to be all over the detail. So these groups are you know have a very rigorous methodology. They will review the information. They will make sure that you know it, it's it's checked. It's double checked. It's not a single person's view. That 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 is the, the you know the standard UK approach for many areas of guidance that we would follow, whether it be in relation to the safety of a drug or the safety of a procedure or, or anything like that. You know, it, it is not normal procedure that you know, individuals would, would seek to drill underneath the, the, the work that has been done by the expert committees. That's why we have them. Okay, I'm going, I'm going back to Paula on this for a follow-up, Michael, but also uh, you didn't answer Pam's question there in relation to are any other countries using the one-hour follow period? No, not as far as I know. I mean, it's a, it's a UK thing. Uh, I agree. Uh, that, that, is, that is the position. And as I say, it's under review. Thank you. And I, I, I think I would really appreciate if you could give... You said there it was a UK-wide body. I would appreciate if you could supply to the committee the names of people from Northern Ireland who were party to that decision. That would be very useful. Thank you. But my second question relates to the financial support scheme. And you had said that, um, that those people who had sort of fallen through the cracks um, had been given a temporary backstop and issues like that. When the British Dental Association um, presented two weeks ago, they said that they knew of about 26 or 27 um, dentists who um, were still in dispute around their um, support payment. Could you confirm how many are now still outstanding? Thank you. OK. Uh, I think I might hand over to, to my colleague, Paul Montgomery, for this one. Sorry, thank you. Yes, uh, hi. Um, there was, yes, there was 26 as part of the uh, development of the maternity leave uh, arrangements. What we said was that anybody who had uh, less than three months data in order to calculate their uh, payment, that they were, their circumstances would be looked at individually. Now, what happened was that uh, the, the 26 people, about 10 of them came through and they had less than three months data and their um, uh, their payments were amended. There was an also a further amount of people who came through who didn't have only three months data. So they've been assessed and looked and went, well, you have more than three months data, so therefore the current arrangements are fair for you. So um, they, they, all 26 have been reviewed. But, but, but in whose judgment is it fair? I, I think, you know, any of the female dentists who've contacted me and maybe others here, you know, they feel that it's sex discrimination that they have been penalised because they were off last year and taking what is in, in employment law their right to take maternity leave. And they've been left now in quite a destitute position, notwithstanding what I have just said about the fact that they can't actually start working um, at, at full pelt because of these one hour of fallow period. Oh, in two, in two, I'll take your point about uh, destitution. Um, the, the issue about um, those who were on maternity leave was a key issue from the very start of the scheme being developed because we recognised that whilst taking the sort of the 2019-20 whatever the total payment divided by, by 12 that was fair and reasonable for most GDPs but it wasn't for those who are maternity leave so we did take measures and amended it so that uh, the months in which they were on maternity leave were excluded as well as the next lowest month so we, we did that and as a result of that the average payment to those who are maternity leave is £4,600 in May now you add on top of that um, the allowances and you're heading towards £6,000 per month. Now if you compare that with what you would get the upper limit, not the average, but the upper limit on the coronavirus job retention scheme where it's £2,500, that's the same as on the self-employed income support scheme. It, it's very hard to judge what is fair or what is not, but in terms of the overall sort of objective numbers, that doesn't look to me to be in terms of destitution, getting six thousand pounds per month. 
on average. Now, of course, we will we will continuously look at if there's evidence that it could be improved, if there's changes that could be made, of course, we will look at it. But we, and we've asked for this evidence whenever somebody's come forward and said, I don't think this is fair. We've asked what sort of, sort of you know, what, what evidence is there that you think that it is not fair? And it, it, it's very rare that it's actually come across. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I, can I, back yeah, go ahead, Paul. Uh, sorry, can I just come back on that, Paul, uh, on the back of Paula's question there, in, ter in terms of the uh, maternity calculation? I mean, it's certainly been raised um, with me, I'm sure with other members, that the, actually the fairer way to calculate would be to remove the three lowest months. Have you, have, you, have you done that calculation and worked out what difference that would make to those payments, to those females? Uh, to be honest, that, that has not been suggested to me so far. No, more than happy to look at that. I honestly don't think that it would make... The, the difficulty is if you, if you remove three months, then it, the months that you're actually looking at then are much smaller and becomes a lot less reliable. So there's a balance between having enough months to make a reliable calculation and taking account of that sort of the possibility that it takes a number of months for individual uh, dentists to return to their, sort of their normal level of activity. Now, this will be different. You know, some some uh, female dentists could return within one month. Some may take six months. You know, it, it is very difficult to sort of judge on that. And and the advice that we got from the board and from the dental advisors was that one month was reasonable. Now, we, we can look at it. I, I honestly don't think uh, looking at the profile of some of them, because it's not a case that they were sort of, you saw a smooth month on month increase as they returned from um, maternity. We didn't see that, it was sort of up and down. So it's not necessarily that if you take go for another, another month or another two months, that that will necessarily result in uh, something that will be satisfactory to the um, uh, those who remain to have concerns. But we will be happy to look at that and sort of see what that was sort of outcome that would provide. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll forward that correspondence um, and, and its completeness to you so that you can take into account and come back to us. Thank you. Sure. And just in relation to a, a related point to that, Paul, of the 26 contested cases, how many of those have been resolved satisfactorily? Well, it's not a matter of, the, it, that of them being resolved. It is a matter that we said that we would look in terms of the individual circumstances if there was less than three months. Now, a lot of the people who then came forward had more than four, three months, so therefore we, we couldn't look at them. So it's not a matter of them being resolved or not. What we have is that I think nine or 10 cases that they uh, received additional payments. I'm going to move on then. I'm going to go to Alex, please. Yeah, just so I can see you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, my issue is to do with PPI. Um, or A, sorry. Um, there seems to be two levels of PPA, level one and level two. So level one, from what you're saying, is, is going out to the dentists as we speak. Uh, and they have access to that. Level two seems to be an issue. So what I'm wondering is why wasn't level two taken into consideration for dentists at the time you were ordering level two um, PPE for equipment right across the health service? Was it a short sight? That, was it not short sighted that that wasn't considered at the time? Or, or what was the reason why the level two hasn't been stockpiled already? Okay, um, I'll take this one. So the, the level two PPE issue, particularly the, the masks that go with level two, uh, have been in short supply for, for really since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there's been a worldwide spike in demand, and that has made it difficult for every country to ensure adequate supplies. On top of that, it's, it's not even getting enough masks. It's getting enough of the right type. So what we have found is that uh, you'll get maybe a month's supply of a particular mask and then that'll run out and you have to use a different type of mask and every mask must be fit tested. The, the, those who use them must be fit tested. So it's it's a very complicated uh, problem uh, and, and consumes a considerable amount of resource just to get people uh, with with a mask that they can use. The, the availability of masks through the BSO procurement route has been such that 
it hasn't been possible for the BSO to build in the dental element. The, the BSO would tell us they, they, they are able to just about keep on top of the trust needs. So the, 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 the hope was that as time went by, there would be the, the, the providers would respond to the increased demand for, for uh, the masks and, and they would become available. That hasn't quite materialised yet. Now, there are some early signs that that might be happening and I was in contact with, with the dedicated dental supply houses who the BSO don't do business with, but the practitioners do. And they're, they're telling me that they have several thousand masks available uh, that, 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 that are appropriate for level two. So it seems as if there, there, are, there are some supplies out there but, but not, but not uh, enough that we, not as much as we would like to see. So, so the fundamental reason why the uh, level two masks weren't secured previously is because they were not available through the BSO procurement route. Okay. Um, I did get a letter the other day um, about a uh, resident who's going to the dentist and they're getting charged 40 pounds extra. To pay for PPE equipment in a dentist, is is that is that normal to be happening, or essentially that depends on whether the patient is being treated under the health service or or privately. So under the health service, no, it's not allowable to make an additional charge like that. Okay. Uh, that's a breach that breaches the rules, and if there's any. Uh, concern that, the, that, that this patient has, that they, they, they believe them, that they are a health service patient, then they, they should report that to the Health and Social Care Board, uh, to the complaint service, and that's available on the Health and Social Care Board website, and there's a phone number as well. If the patient is a private patient, then it is that is allowable. The private dentists can set their own fees, and I'm aware that uh, they are factoring in the additional costs of level two PPE, and very often making that clear to, to patients in, in, the, in the invoice or in the bill that they will present to the patient. So it, it really depends whether it's a private or a health service patient. Okay, no, thank you. That's very helpful for me to know. So thank yeah. you. Colin. Thank you very much, Chair, Chair and um, thank you for the presentation this morning. I think maybe, Michael and Paul, you're getting um, the frustration from the committee here that week after week after week, we just keep getting this blank, the scientific evidence says, and then whenever we ask what is the scientific evidence, we get a very incoherent answer from regularly um, from officials, and I think we're getting to the stage that maybe the committee needs to address what is the scientific evidence, what does it actually mean, who was involved in it, and if it is the leading scientific evidence, then why are we part of the only country that's actually following procedures whenever everybody else is doing something different? That's a gaping hole that we absolutely need to have an investigation into and look at. Um, and I do want to declare somewhat of an interest, Chair, as well, before I ask my question. I had half of a dental procedure done in January and was awaiting a referral to get the second half of that treatment done and it can't be done until the dental practices are up and running again um, and that's been causing a certain amount of frustration so I know what lots of people out there are thinking but further to the questions that have been asked I do need to push you a little bit Michael because the sector is concerned about access to the level 2 PPE and you've used terms like it seems like there's enough there is some PPE that's out there what is going to happen if a practice isn't able to access? Will you be comfortable as the chief dental officer that that just means that that sector, that, that clinic will just have to shut down and not provide services and people in that area will not be able to get the treatment that they need? The, the short answer is no. I, I, I wouldn't be happy with that. And we, we will have to keep the situation under review. It, it's, I mean, the, the whole COVID crisis has been you know, has been really hallmarked by uncertainty. And we're not quite sure on a number of fronts where, where what way, for example, that we've mentioned earlier, the one hour follow period and the review of that and the review of aerosol generating procedures, what the outcome of, of that's going to be. So yeah, we, we, will, we will really just have to wait and see what, how practices are able to cope and if it if it, it transpires that there you know the levels of of access that we would have, would have hoped for, particularly during phase phase three when when we're looking for aerosol generating procedures to provide the definitive treatments that the patients need, then then we would have to look at alternatives as to how we deal with that problem. But we wouldn't want to be in a situation where practitioners are are being remunerated to undertake activity, and the activity is not being provided. 
you know, and, and patients aren't getting the care they need. So there, there would have to be, um, you know, an examination of that and, and a solution found. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I would suggest that sort of the, you know, being not being uh, able to see into the future, but I think I can see that there's going to be problems here, and I would suggest that maybe um, within your department that you're starting to try and find solutions to deal with that now, because I think it is inevitably going to be a problem in two or three weeks' time. And maybe just a question generally on the sector. Um, the representations that we're getting uh, from those in the sector is that morale isn't good and that communication isn't good. Would, will you undertake to investigate maybe with a couple of key practices just where the breakdown in communication is and ways that you can improve that so that people out in the sector, sector are actually getting up-to-date information, they know what's happening, they know what they can do, and that that might help improve morale, which we've been told is at an all-time low? Well, absolutely. Look, I, I, I mean, I have a very good working relationship with the with the British Dental Association, and I'm in regular contact with them uh, and the local dental committees and you know dentists in general. Um, I think part of the difficulty is that when we when we communicate with practitioners, we you know there's no point in communicating to tell them that we don't know really. And the, the, as I say, the situation it, there is uncertainty around it, but as soon as there is clarity. We communicate now. You know, so that that is that has been the strategy up to now and the strategy going forward. But absolutely, if, if practitioners would like to know, even that there there is no certainty if that if that is helpful, versus uh, giving them definite information, we can do that. Um, you know, that, that that's that's no problem. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to uh, take soundings from uh, practices as to what they want to know. Um, yeah, that's fine. Sure, just as a comment at the end of that, can I just advise that if you don't know and you don't communicate, it comes across that you don't care. If you don't know and you communicate that you don't know, then people understand that you don't know. So I would say if you don't know, make sure that people in the sector know that so that they can understand it. And if you get that, you'll be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, going across now to Deputy Chair Pam. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you again for your attendance here today. Um, I've got well, I've got lots of questions, but I'll try and keep them to minimum. Um, in terms of the um, the face masks and the fit testing, um, could you tell us what evidence is, is behind the use of FFP3 face masks for dental aerosol generating procedures, and why the UK is the only country in Europe that requires these masks to be fit tested? And also, if if the FFP3 masks are currently recommended for the AGPs. Why have they not been included in the three million items of PPE being provided by the Department of Health? There, there are a number of different issues there. So, so the, when when I was mentioning about the level two PPE masks, they, they are the FFP3 masks. So it's the it's the availability of the FFP3 masks fundamentally that the BSO weren't able to to source. They weren't able to get FFP3, and and that that is why we weren't able to provide level two PPE to. to Practices, so it's, it, it's an availability problem uh, in the in the in the, the way that BSO procure large volumes of PPE. In terms of uh, why uh, FFP3 masks are used, th so there are other types of masks. Um, there's KN95 mask, which is a Chinese certification, and there's an FFP2 mask. Now, the difference between an FFP3 and an FFP2 and a KN95 is the level of filtration that's provided. So an FFP3 provides the highest level of filtration and therefore the greatest level of protection. So th this is something that many practitioners, so, so you know, a lot of dentists will, will, have come to, will have come to the department or the board, particularly in the early days of, of coronavirus, and said that they wanted to make sure that we were being, uh, you know, as, keeping them as safe as possible. So FFP3 keeps them as, as safe as possible. However, the guidance from Public Health England, again, that the whole UK follows, is that FFP3, FFP3 masks are not available. FF2, FFP2 masks, which provide a slightly lower level of protection, 95% filtration, uh, are acceptable. So, so that, that is an alternative which, which is, is being considered uh, across all of the countries. And in fact, in, in England, it is largely FFP2 masks which, which are supplied. The fit testing issue, it's, it's, it's basically to make sure that 
if the mask has, uh, has any leaks around where the mask contacts the face, then the, the mask is not effective. So there's no point having an expensive, high filtration mask if it's leaking. And so the fit testing process ensures that the mask fits properly. Now we, we know from the results of fit testing programs that depending on the mask, quite a significant proportion of those individuals who are tested fail. So those, those masks are not offering the protection that the wearer would think. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be safe, it, it wouldn't be responsible for you know, the health service in Northern Ireland to say to people, you don't need to be fit tested for that mask, knowing very well that there'll be a proportion of people for whom that mask is leaking and for whom that mask is not offering the protection they think. So we, we really couldn't go down that line. Okay, so, and the, so the FFP, two and three, does that come under the level two of the uh, provision of PPE? Yes, it does. Both, both could be classified as being uh, acceptable under level two, although your starting point is the FFP3, but if they're not available, then FF2P2 can be considered. But both two and three require fit testing? Okay, so in, in the UK, Yes. Uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland, where they use FFP2, they, they don't insist on fit testing. Okay. And the, is that right that there, nowhere else in Europe requires fit testing of these masks? I'm not sure about the, the, the rest of Europe in general, um, but I do know down, down in the Republic they, they don't require fit testing. But again, this this is the standard. I mean, this is this is not specific to dentistry. This is a health service wide thing within the trusts, within you know all the countries. It is the same standard. It's a you know it's a UK standard that if you're using these masks, you know for aerosol generating procedures, they are they are only only worth using if you've been fit tested. So so we are following. It's not a dentistry thing, and the, the the follow period and the AGP and the level two they are not specifically dental things. They are, they are health service wide approaches that are taken. And so we are completely consistent with what is believed to be best practice for all the health services in the UK. And regardless of whether it's dentistry or general, general healthcare, we, we are completely consistent with those standards. Okay, so um, will the department be providing those FFB three or two masks with the, with the level uh, two provision? Is that the understanding that that will be provided? And then, you know, where is there obviously is concern then around the timing? The 20th of July is not very far away, and if they haven't yet got those that provision, how can they fit test it when they don't know what they're even fit testing for? And how how do they plan that? How is that paid for? Does the department pay for that? Do the dentists pay for that themselves? Okay, so in the, in the normal remuneration arrangements, there's an element of the remuneration that practices receive, which goes towards uh, the running cost of the practice and PPE. Now, we fully accept that the costs of PPE have gone up very significantly. So le leaving that to one side, then the, the possibility of the PPE being provided centrally in terms of FFP2 and FFP3 masks, that isn't possible at the moment. Although. That is, again, something that we, we keep under review with BSO. If it transpires that the practices, even though we, we feel that there is some availability at the smaller level from the smaller providers that BSO can't tap into, the practices may be able to tap into, even though we feel that that is possible, if it transpires that that is not the case and practices are not able to undertake aerosol generating procedures because they can't access the masks, then, then we would have to look at how we go forward in that. But, but at this point in time, we, we are not proposing to provide the practices with either FFP2 or FFP3 masks, purely because we cannot source them for them. Thank you, I'll have to, I'll have to move. Okay, I'm going to go across now to Orlea on the telephone, and then I'll be going to Jerry, back to Pat on the telephone, and then Alan in the room. So Orlea, are you there? Yes, I could. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, Michael, thanks very much um, for all your, your answers thus far and for coming to the committee today. Um, my first question was in your opening remarks you had mentioned around this, um, the level one to three million items of um, 
level one PPE and um, you had says that there um, that arrangements are being put in place to source and to distribute. So I'm just wondering, have the three million items been sourced? You know, do we have them um, or do we not? Um, just to see maybe where, where that's at, um, first of all, please. Okay. My, my understanding is that they have been sourced and I have a video conference a teleconference actually later on today with BSO on exactly the state of play for this. The, the, the bigger challenge is the distribution. So the, this, the, the amount of PP we're talking about here is colossal. We're talking about 30 articulated lorries of PP to be distributed among the dental practices in Northern Ireland. It's over 700 pallets of, of PP. So in, in terms of the logistics of getting that out across Northern Ireland in, in the coming weeks, and we, ex we expect the, the deliveries to begin next week, it's, it's very challenging. So BSO are working with the distribution company to make that happen. But uh, as of, the, of this moment, uh, that, that, is as, that, that is as much as I know. As I say, I'm talking to BSO uh, around lunchtime today. Okay, that's great, Michael, thank you. And then just second of all, um, in relation to the level two, um, PPE items then. I know other members have already covered it, um, but I just wanted to ask again to bring it back to your opening comments. Um, you were talking about that up until um, now, thankfully, you have been able to cope with um, emergency procedures, and, and that's fantastic. Um, and, and you say that this, this will continue to be the case. But my concern would be, given the, the fact that the emergency clinics are going to be closing from Monday to Friday, and that we're now faced with clearly it's unclear that if our dentist um, surgeries are going to have the access to the level two PPE that they would need to you know to do those um, those sorts of procedures. So to me, we're facing into a scenario that you won't have the emergency clinics Monday to Friday if the dentists don't have the appropriate level two PPE. Then what happens to all those um, emergency cases that might need that help? I think it's really worrying. And also, has this been raised with the Minister or the Chief Medical Officer as yet? Okay, so um, yes, uh, I, I have been in touch with the, the Chief Medical Officer about the, about the issue that you know, you're, you've described, um, uh, the challenges in relation to the, the availability of PPE and what that may mean in terms of what care is available um, after the 20th of July. Um, I think, I mean, it's it's essentially it's it's some of the stuff we've 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 covered previously. The the, the availability of the PPE, it, it's 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 likely to be suboptimal. But if in terms of the urgent dental care centres, the the total number of patients that are seen per week in the urgent dental care centres, and, and you know, I I mean, the urgent dental care centres have been a terrific success and work very well. But the number of patients that are seen there is around about 250 or 300 per week. So there, there are 370 dental practices in Northern Ireland. If, if every one of those practices could do one AGP per week, that would cover the number of patients that have been going to the urgent dental care centres. So you know, whilst we would encourage as much activity as possible through, through practices, they, you know, it, it's, it seems reasonable that even a small amount of activity from the practices would mean that the urgent dental care centres didn't need to operate seven days a week. And obviously, keeping them operating seven days a week, there's a cost involved in that, and that, that is a cost to the GDS budget. So it's, it's, all, it's, it's about the most efficient use of resources as well here. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, would be, I would be hopeful that the activity and practices would, would offset the reduction from seven days a week to two days a week, but of course, as uh, you know, as I've said in, in response to a few other questions, we, we will keep the situation under review. It's not it's not uh, a one way street where that's it, all the best, and you know we hope it works out. Not at all. Uh, it, it will be monitored very closely, and we will respond to it uh, as necessary. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay. Thank you, uh, Orlea and Michael, and going now to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the idea that um, the Chief Dental Officer shouldn't challenge evidence to me is pretty startling, to be frank. Um, I mean, I want my Chief Dental Officer 
they challenge evidence, they scrutinise, they go through it with a fine tooth comb. So uh, that's that's quite worrying and quite startling uh, to me, and obviously m many other members going by their, their comments. Um, and it seems to me there's a, an approach to just follow England, to follow London, and to do it uh, in a blind uh, way. So that's very, very concerning uh, to me. Um, from the, the BDA, um, suggests the possibility of a majority of practices will not have necessary PPE, as, as people have indicated, uh, AGP PPE. Initially, it was um, the department's, and I think Michael's, intention that level two PPE would be supplied, and you've said obviously problems with uh, sourcing. To me, it sounds like another PPE botch again. Um, and I would like to ask how many times has there been bids, application for bids, what work went into securing or attempting to secure um, the level two of PPE? It sounds very, very concerning, and we've obviously been aware of this pandemic from March. So I'd like to know what work has been done by the department, by BSO, by the minister, by whomever, in relation to that. And just finally, um, the management board was obviously referred to. I think there's a real, real concern about the composition of the management board generally, uh, in terms of the people uh, who are not uh, on it. And we're hearing, you know, leaked possibilities of emergency departments maybe being reduced and, and run down. So there's a big concern uh, over that. that I think has to be reflected and acted upon more generally. Okay. Um, so. Going back to the, the, the you know the UK guidance on uh, PPE and uh, aerosol generating procedures and, and follow periods, and uh, the view you, you expressed there that uh, the chief dental officer should be should be challenging though that 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 expert advice across the UK. I mean, I I am in weekly contact, weekly video conferences with the other uh, UK chief dental officers, so we discuss. Uh, what advice is, is being issued from public health and the interpretation of that and our view in relation to that. And, and I, I can tell you that, that you know, up to now, there, 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 is no, um, there, there is no view that the Public Health England advice is, is inappropriate. We accept that the UK has perhaps adopted a relatively cautious approach on, on the, at, the, at the international level, but you know, this this is designed to protect to protect patients, staff, and the public. So you know nobody wants to take take risks with with the health of the population. That that is that is what is trying to be achieved here. I did mention that uh, as uh, and is the, is the norm that all this advice is subject to review, and so the, the experts who who generated the advice and, and those panels are still live. And that, that advice is currently being reviewed with, with the possibility of changes, and we're expecting information that in the, in the coming days. So that, that's, a, that's a very scientifically rigorous process, and it's a very, it's, it's a very healthy way of, of looking at scientific advice that's not set in stone, that it's reviewed in the light of new information and new circumstances. Uh, in relation to the PPE question and uh, trying to source PPE and the work that's been done up until now. There, there have been a number of different groups that, that have been looking at this, uh, both at the, at the board level and at the departmental level. And certainly on, on both fronts, I've been feeding in information to the groups, either directly or through uh, staff who, who, who work with me. And we have been making the point very clearly that the dentistry not only consumes a, a really enormous amount of PPE, it, it really does to very, very significant quantities, but also that uh, in order to undertake uh, aerosol generating procedures, what PPE is necessary. And so that, that those representations have been made to both the PPE cell in the department and to, to the modeling groups that, that have been involved in this work as well. And ultimately it is that work that, that has culminated in, in the minister agreeing to the to the to the PP being supplied to practitioners that we discussed earlier uh, is is currently um, sorry Michael just just for clarity so, sorry to cut in just for clarity how many attempts were made to um, in terms of bids or applications for the level two PP how many attempts were were uh, made to uh, acquire that 
I suppose it, and it, it wouldn't really have come in that form. Uh, so what, what we're really doing there is fe feeding our requirements into the PPE sale. And then that is, tr that is translated from there onto a bid. So there, there isn't really um, necessarily an individual bid from every single part of the system, but it's, it's making those centrally aware of what the requirements are for, for that, that particular part of the system. So as I said, that, that has been going on for, for quite, a, quite a protracted period on both fronts within the board and within, within the department. I'm struggling for an answer there, but, but thanks. Okay. And it, it was the third part, sorry, on the management board. And again, uh, you know, I, I'm confident that the dental perspective can be represented on the management board through the chief medical officer. And, but obviously I will review the paperwork. And if there is anything that needs to be contributed, I, I can obviously put my views across to the CMO. Okay, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to go across to Pat now on the phone. But just before that, to pick up on, on a point that you have raised there, Michael, in relation to rigour of the sense. And this has been a recurring pattern where we have been asking now for many weeks because we have a role in terms of scrutinising uh, the, the evidence of these decisions. And key decisions, are, are and, and in, in some cases, life and death decisions are based on. But surely part of the rigour of scientific evidence is that it's published, it's peer-reviewed, it's challenged a bill and challenged on an ongoing basis, so that, so that it, is, it, it, it is rigorous. And I think I'm, I'm returning again to this issue about we have a devolved health system here. I don't understand why we, and there seems to be a kind of an indication here that in all circumstances we follow what you have said is UK advice. What's the point in having a devolved system if we're going to follow blindly everything that's being generated in, in a system which is a different system and in a different place in relation to Orlad? Okay, so basically the, 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 the UK advice sets the response to, to our depending on different levels of virus threat. So, the, and we, 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 are, we are working in, in accordance with that. Now, within, within Northern Ireland, of course, we, we, are, we need to keep, uh, we need to be aware of the, the, the indicators, the, the, the measures of circulating virus. We need to be aware of the health services ability to respond. We need to be aware of the availability of PPE and many, many other factors. So, you know, we, we will look at those and, and you know, we, we can make a determination up to a point in terms of timing and that's, that's what we've done and that's what all the other UK countries have done. They have adjusted the timing of when they feel it's appropriate, bearing in mind local circumstances, to move to different levels of, of dental provision in this case. So it, it, isn't, you know, it isn't a one size fits all. There, there is undoubtedly an opportunity to tailor it, reflecting local circumstances. But Mike, you said, you said we have flexibility up to a point. We don't have up to a point devolution. We have full devolution of health. And surely every decision must only not be informed by the differences, but actually the, the, the decisions taken must reflect the differences. So, I mean, you know, discussions are, 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 are taking place even at the moment in relation to the, the, what is the appropriate response, bearing, bearing in mind these things. So. I mean, it, it's not set in stone, and and we, you know, the evidence that's that's there in terms of our own circumstances, and, and where we where we fit in with the with the various responses set out in the in the in the UK guidance, that 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 is that's being looked at. So at the moment, right now, as I speak to you, we we believe that our response is appropriate, but that that could change, you know. So we we are we are always looking at. What, what the level of threat is in Northern Ireland, and at the same time balancing that against how much service we can provide safely. So it's it's all it's always a trade off, but it's it's not a case where we don't we, we just take the you know to take the UK position and everybody in the UK does the same. Not at all. That's that's why there is so much variation in the way the UK countries have handled this, and the, no two no two countries have done the same thing in dental terms anyway. Okay, I'm going to go across now to uh, Pat on the phones and just to, to draw members' attention to the fact that we are getting on in terms of time. So if members could keep their, their questions as brief as possible and also responses as direct and as relevant as possible to the question asked. Um, go ahead, Pat, please. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, I have two relatively short questions. First of all, Michael, you have uh, spoken about PPE and, and, and fairly obscure terminology. Uh, you've said it's suboptimal. Basically, what you're saying is there's a shortage of PPE. The upshot of that is that the vast majority of dental practices aren't going to be able to carry out 95% of routine care, such as fillings, crowns, uh, root canal, uh, scales. Uh, so what's going to change? Uh, as far as I can see it, uh, dental care is going to deteriorate. That's going to lead to deterioration overall of, of uh, oral health. Uh, and the associated medical conditions that go along with that. Is that not the case? At the, at the moment, there is a significant amount of dental care being provided. Now, ideally, uh, you know, and to provide definitive treatments, aerosol generating procedures are required. And that is that is when you're into requiring the, the higher level of PPE and the masks that, that we spoke about earlier. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you, Michael, but is 95% of routine care, are they not AGPs? I mean, my, my view would be it maybe wouldn't be as high as that, but you know, yes, it's it's the, the vast majority of uh, routine dental care is an AGP. That's that's correct, and you know, worldwide, the view is try to minimise AGPs. So because AGPs are perceived to be a risk for virus transmission, if if you look at uh, you know all the guidance that's provided. To you know, in virtually any country that I've looked at, they, they say, look, you know, try to avoid AGPs if at all possible. So that is an inherent problem of you know of a of a virus which can be transmitted in an aerosol. Uh, there's really there's really you no know, way around that. You know, the, the, the solution is the, the, the PPE. The, the, the availability of the PPE is through the BSO route, which would be the way we could provide it centrally. It's it's not there, so it's it's not possible for us to do that. What is possible is for practices to source some amount of PPE, and you know, and the remuneration arrangements that are currently in place. Hopefully, should you know, they they should allow them to do some amount of aerosol generating procedures within within the available within their remuneration. So, we we can't source it from centrally, but we believe that there is availability through their own channels, which which is normally what they would do. It, it, it isn't dentists are independent contractors. We never normally provide PPE to dentists. That's that's unheard of. So you know the recent the recent thing that has happened that we mentioned the supplies that are currently being you know organized to be delivered, that's that's complete that's a one off. That's a, that's the first time that's ever happened. Okay, just just before you come okay. in, Pat, with it, Pat, a completely different situation. Pat, before you come in with a second question, that first question there, you were a wee bit hard to pick up. I'm not sure if it's broadband, but if just if you can just uh, go a little bit slower, maybe it was a wee bit, wee bit difficult to pick up. But go ahead, please. Can you go ahead with the second question, Pat? Okay. Uh I want to ask you about uh, health inequalities. Um, we have among the worst uh, oral health uh, among children here. Constituency that I represent has, uh, you know, is at the very bottom of the league in all of that. Uh, the health inequalities in West Belfast are particularly stark. And what, what I want to ask you, Michael, is since you have come into post, what have you, uh, oral health entities, and what is your plan to sort them out in the future? Okay, I think I think if I can just paraphrase, I think what I'm getting from that question, Michael, is since you have come into post, what have you done to address health inequalities and what plans are in place at the present time? Okay, so so I I've been in post since uh, the beginning of April, so a little over over three months, uh, and I mean, obviously that period of time has you know has been marked by the enormous challenges of coronavirus. 
So my, my time has been you know, very much devoted to, to trying to deal with that problem. That is the most immediate threat. The, I, the, the health inequalities issue is something that uh, across really uh, all countries is, uh, exists and it's something that in Northern Ireland there are programmes which are long established to tackle. And so we, we have seen the overall rural health in the Northern Ireland population improve, but also there have been improvements in those groups which were traditionally uh, would have had lower levels of oral health. So it, it's not that uh, the population has moved uh, in general and others haven't got any better at all. You know, we're, we're seeing some improvement and the, the, the approaches that are, that are used, which are targeted, targeted to those who are at greatest risk, do seem to be effective. But the oral health improvement group for children, which when, when, when we get some element of, of quietening down of the coronavirus situation, will will be you know we'll, we will be focusing on that as, as, a, as a priority, and that that is going to be one way that we will look at uh, the best approach to, to tackle oral health inequalities among children. But things things are, are are definitely moving in the right direction, and just to give you an indication of that. Back in 2004, 2005, there would have been, you know, well over 8,000 general anaesthetics provided to children. And th those were children who very often were from deprived communities with high levels of dental decay. The last year figures were available, which is 1819, that was down to 4,000, a little over 4,000. So the number of children getting general anaesthetics in Northern Ireland over that period of time, you know, a 14 year period has, has halved. So whilst I agree that there is work to be done, we, we do have to acknowledge, and particularly for all those who have been involved in the hard work, you know, they've put in the hard work, it wouldn't be fair on them to make them think that they, their, their work hasn't yielded results. You know, it is worth recognizing that, that the oral health is better and, and the oral health of those who are in more deprived areas is better, although there's plenty more work to be done. I completely acknowledge that. Thank you. And finally, going then across to Alan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sure that the uh, the panel that uh, arrived at the, and crafted the the UK guidance uh, includes probably some of the uh, most prominent uh, experts uh, available in the country. And, and notwithstanding whatever the evidence is that uh, that led them to, uh, to uh, issue their guidance, uh, Michael, can you say on the record uh, today? that following uh, the UK guidance uh, is currently in the best interests of both the practitioners and the citizens of Northern Ireland. And I know that a member uh, of this committee last week is on the record as saying that we're through the far side of the pandemic pretty much. And it's certainly not the case, and I'd certainly like to see the evidence uh, that led the member to make that statement. So we can't be complacent, we can't take shortcuts. Surely you have a professional responsibility to continue to follow the best advice available. And the Chairman has alluded to her quite forcibly that health in Northern Ireland is devolved, it's quite correct. That should not uh, exclude us from taking the best advice from wherever we can get it. I have no doubt that the advice that's coming from the UK is the best advice available. And certainly uh, in the past, the fact that we are evolved has not stopped members of this committee uh, calling for uh, the advice of the World Health Organization or indeed uh, uh, health advice coming from the Republic of Ireland uh, to be deployed in Northern Ireland. So I don't think being evolved. <laughs> Uh, should stop us seeking the best advice uh, that's available at the current time. Okay, so yes, I, 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 I would agree that uh, it's incumbent upon me to, to follow the best advice. To, and, uh, you know, I believe that the, the UK uh, process for the development of advice uh, is, is excellent and very rigorous. So to me, that is the best advice. I would also add, though, that you know, the, the, the advice is subject to change, is subject to review, as is ongoing at the moment. So, you know, that, that is due to, to, to report very, very soon. And of course, we need to apply the advice in the Northern Ireland context. So again, that is, that is something that is act actively being looked at at the moment. So it's a very dynamic situation, but, but absolutely, the, you know, the UK, the UK advice rem remains the official, the official advice 
for for all of the UK countries, and you know that that's that's certainly the situation. Thank you. And Megan, just before I bring in Colin, are you therefore saying that you specifically do not, nor will not, look at advice from elsewhere? Alan has referenced other sources of advice. Are you saying you solely go by the advice coming from Whitehall? I think our, our, our starting point is is the UK advice. You know, our starting point is, is are those expert expert committees, which you know have have as far as I'm aware representation from across the UK. Um, you know that 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 is where we start from. Now, beyond that, I mean, we you know within Northern Ireland, we we do have to we have to look at the specifics of the Northern Ireland situation, and we have to look at what 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 is the most appropriate response for the Northern Ireland population. And that is that is something which is which is ongoing, you know, uh, within the Department of Health. So, you know, it's I mean, I, I, that's really as much as I can say at the moment. Um, I, you know, it's it's not in a set in stone, and you know, it, it it's 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 something which is under review. That's uh, you know, we 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 will definitely be taking decisions which are in the best interest of the Northern Ireland population. Quick final point from Colin. Yeah, Michael, three times in your answer there you had said that the UK advice is the best advice. O on what grounds do you make that assumption? And given that some of the uh, decisions that are taken uh, impact only the UK, why is the American advice less? Why is the Australian advice less? Why is the Japanese? I mean, why is it? Why are you pinning and saying that the UK advice is the best uh, compared to other places if it's the only advice? That's been handed out in certain incidences. Because I mean, I, I I would understand the 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 process and the rigor that would be in place in the UK system, and quite quite frequently, a lot of countries follow the UK advice, you know, in other ways. So the, the advice that may be in place in New Zealand or in Australia or in other countries, it's it's not that they have gone and you know completely rewritten the advice. They may well have looked at the UK advice. But they have applied that to their situation where there are lower levels of virus circulating in the population. And as I mentioned earlier, so it's you know it's almost like they're they're you know a series of shelves, and that's that's what the UK advice is providing for 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 certain situations. That these are the shelves that you, you that this is the level and the you know that you you will come in at, and that is that. And where it's to, do, to look at response. And Michael, would, would you accept that the advice that has been generated by, by the British government has been broadly, widely challenged, even from within significant people within health in, in Britain? But should we not also be looking at advice from places like New Zealand, who are similar sized populations, similar geographies? Would that not be relevant advice also? Yeah, I, I, I look at the guidance you know, from, from all those countries, and the difference is essentially that, that those countries, I mean, in New Zealand, there's very, very few uh, numbers of cases. That is essentially the difference. If there was the same number of cases in New Zealand as there, there would be in the UK, then I would imagine their response would be very similar. So, uh, you know, it's essentially, that is essentially it. There's a lot of commonality in, in the approach in different countries. With, within dentistry, part of the difference is that it's the way the systems are set up. So in, in dentistry in Northern Ireland, it is largely a health service system. In the Republic of Ireland, for example, most dental care is not provided through the state-run healthcare system. It's private. So that that alone, that health service private split, changes this, change, changes the way that the, the individual practitioners and the way the governance system in the country operates. So there, there are there are lots of lots of subtleties in here that influence the way each individual country approaches this. But but I have to say, in my conversations with the practitioners, in my conversations with the BDA, the level, our response to the, 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 the level of threat from the virus is, is perceived by practitioners to be to be about right. I, I wouldn't say that all dentists agree, particularly private dentists are more enthusiastic about moving forward more quickly. But the, 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 the vast majority of health service dentists, as far as I'm aware, are very content with the approach that we have adopted. And at the end of the day, we, you know, it's the health service that we, we're talking about. It's the health service that we're, you know, we're we're paying for. So, you know, that, I I don't sense the same amount of discontent that that the committee are are portraying here. 
uh, you know, obviously those who are unhappy with the current arrangements are those who will complain most. Those who are happy are less likely to complain. But certainly in my, in my interactions with the profession in general, that, you know, they, they are content with the view that's been taken. In fact, it wasn't very long ago that they wanted even a more, a more restrictive approach and that uh, dentists shouldn't have to see patients, even urgent cases. So it, it, I don't think it's representative of the profession to say that everybody is pushing for um, a lowering of restrictions. Okay, and, and I appreciate that you have stayed well beyond time and you have engaged rigorously there with us on that. There is one other issue, though, that I do need to address in relation to something that's been raised within, within the committee session. And you had referenced in response to one of the members' questions uh, a payment of, of an average or whatever, a payment of £6,000 to dentists as opposed to £2,000. Now, first of all, that £6,000, if, if my understanding is correct, associate dentists would not be getting that. There's, there's money that comes out for equipment, there's money that uh, comes out for PPE or whatever. So associate dentists wouldn't be getting that 6K for a start, and that that's, that that's not really a fair comparison. But more significantly, that was in relation to uh, particular issues that women are facing in terms of maternity. So would the more relevant comparison not be between a male and a female dentist, rather than, than the job retention scheme, in terms of equality on that issue? Do you want me to take that, yeah, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of the, in general terms, uh, female dentists earn uh, twenty five percent less than male dentists in overall terms. Um, under the financial support scheme, the payments are six percent less. So the differential under the FSS is significantly lower than it is for general dentistry. Okay, and in relation to the issue around the 6K and the associate, the, the payments for equipment and the take home versus the job retention scheme, was that a fair comparison? I, it, it is because it includes, uh, obviously, the 6,000 includes um, principal dentists, and it, it's because the, um, the coronavirus job retention is an upper limit. But if you want to, t if you want to adjust for, um, the sort of the fixed costs that are still being paid for, that would bring down the 6,000 to about 3,750. So you're still well in excess of the upper limit for the coronavirus job retention scheme. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I want to thank both of you for your, your presentations to us here today, both the acting chief dentist officer and uh, Paul yourself in terms of your role. Thank you for your presentation and for your engagement with the committee um, and good luck with your work in the future and, and the important work and job that, that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so, any thoughts on that, members, or anything that... that... Sure, yeah. I'm a bit disturbed at the way... Now, obviously, the Chief Dental Officer is doing his job, and, and that's fine, but... This insistence upon that we must follow the UK model um, and then referencing places like New Zealand and Australia and other places as being different. But sir, a very quick look, about 554 deaths here uh, in, in Northern Ireland versus 40, near 45,000 across the UK. And even if you change the population, if you weight it for the population, the, the, the entire population of the UK is about 33 times bigger than Northern Ireland. If you multiply that um, 500 deaths by 33, it brings you to 18,000, but there was actually 45,000 deaths. And what I'm saying is that the reaction of the British government is going to be to a pandemic that is at a much, much higher level than we actually have here in the North. And I think the point that you make, that's why we're devolved. It's a devolved health so that we can have our own response to our own needs in our own community. But if we just keep copying and pasting the, the um, response from the UK committee uh, and guidelines, I think that's skewing us away off where we actually need to be. And that's having a massive impact on the ground. And I think there's something in there that we need to seek clarity from urgently. Yeah, I'm going to Paula and then see an indication from Maria. Well, I, I suppose I have a file of my outlook of, of correspondence from dentists, and I have loads of it. So I think, in some ways, the, the comments towards the end there about you know the vast majority of dentists are, are not concerned, and it's only a few that are shouting loud. 
I didn't really get a sense today that they have properly engaged with the dental community in terms of setting these, you know, in terms of feedback. And as I was trying to allude to, that there are some procedures that they could introduce um, that would reduce the, the aerosol generating aspect of it. So I suppose in some ways, I just think that this was a decision that was taken without proper consultation and engagement with the sector. Okay, um, or Leah. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just concerned after the conversation and after obviously the correspondence that we got in this morning, and it just seems that the profession genuinely is really unprepared to open up on the twentieth of July. And I don't know, as a health committee, what we could do if it's like, you know, an urgent letter to the CMO or to the health minister. Michael did mention that they were looking at um, alternatives. That they're, they're looking at alternatives now but i mean it's the 9th of july and what i'm worried about is the, the the emergency procedures when people need them i know that michael did give the rationale saying that at the minute the emergency centers were doing the 250 to 300 per week and then he was talking in the context of because we'll have 370 practices right across the north that that should pick up the 250 300 emergency procedures but i mean even based on a geographical spread, how, how is that going to work in practice? I'm just really worried that that some of um, that some of our constituents and that some you know people out there are going to be left with with no access to emergency procedures if they need them Monday to Friday. Jerry, thanks, Chair. I mean, I assure people's concerns about the you know follow London approach with uh, very little questions asked. Seemingly, that uh, that was my impression of, of what goes on happy to be corrected on that. Um, I think also there's, I don't know if anybody else understood the answer to my question around PPE. I mean, it was talked around, you know, I am still not clear how many applications or bids or efforts were made to secure this PPE. So I think we, we should write uh, to the department uh, around that. Um, and also I think we need to ask if anybody else knows the answer, uh, tell me, but when was it realised that there was a shortage? When did the department know, and what action did they take thereafter? I, I think there's massive questions around that, Chair, as well. Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, I think, um, I mean, quite often we are criticising and saying, talking about what the, what the department and what the government is not doing, and how they're not protecting us from the virus and, and the pandemic. So it, I think it's to be welcomed that actually it, the level of protection has been maximised in this level, but at the same time, I suppose you want to find a balance so that to ensure that people are getting the oral health care that they need. And we're obviously concerned about, um, you know, cancer diagnosis and whatnot as well, and what has been missed there and what, what that means in terms of um, non-COVID health complications arising from the pandemic. So th there, there is a balance to be struck. But I welcome the fact that that the UK is taking a more stringent approach to it, and, and, and actually that they are they are seeking to protect us from from this virus, and that recognition is there. But at the same time, I think it would be good if um, obviously we're not health experts, but th if that evidence was made public as to what they're uh, acting. I mean, what, what I think the part we need to do is convince the dental the dentists basically that that this is the right mode of transport and this is the way to go at this stage in the pandemic so I, you know i think that there is a balance to be struck here so i wouldn't be I certainly wouldn't be critical of the fact that we're being over cautious it would seem compared to the rest of the world yet that might be a good thing and 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 possibly in the light of emerging evidence coming forward and, and how because we don't quite know how the virus is um transmitted and we're learning every day so I think we need to find a balance there, but I think it would be good to to see the chief dental officer saying that actually that he wants to see the evidence as well, and that we should be looking at it in a devolved way as well. I think that would also be helpful. Okay, so would there be a broad agreement then that we write to the department expressing uh, rather urgent concerns around the the cliff edge of, of the twentieth of June, um, and asking them to to adv advise us in terms of their engagement with the sector, in terms of their um, in, in terms of their efforts to secure PPE and when, P, when it, it was realised that was a difficulty, and the evidence to, to provide us with the evidence on which their current decision making is based. 
Yeah. The members content with that? Yeah. Yes. Chair, I think we do need to add in as well the the issues of, the issue of the maternity payments as well because I mean it would appear that this is not um, remotely fair and uh, it is a gender issue. Uh, and you know we've heard the words discrimination thrown about, and I think that they are justified. Quite frankly, I think that does need to be resolved. Yes. And I welcome the fact that Paul Montgomery said he would look again at that calculation. But I, I think we do need to be raising that again with the department. That, that, that this and um, you know, challenge the fact that this is certainly perceived to be um, gender discrimination. I think members are broadly content with that. And Paula? Just a quick one, just to say, because some of the correspondence came in at the 11th hour, essentially, and there may be some issues that we didn't pick up, I think it would be useful if the clerk and we worked together to see if there's any other issues that we didn't raise, just to get some clarity on it. Yeah, okay. Are you okay with that? Okay, members, I'm going to take just suggest a very, very quick comfort break before we go into the next session, so like literally five minutes, if we could come back at 12.20. I can turn the stairs before me. Thank you, and you're welcome back to uh, public session. So, members, we're now going to SR 2020 forward slash 90, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations 2020, and agenda, agenda item 7, which is SR 2020 forward slash 97, the Health Protection Coronavirus Public Health Advice for Persons Travelling to NA Regulations 2020. So members, I propose we take items 6 and 7 together and I refer members to the papers at tab 6 and tab 7 of the pack. The department has made two statutory rules in regard to international travel during the pandemic. The first of these, SR 2020 forward slash 90, requires those arriving in the north who have been in a country outside the common travel area to provide information including contact details, and to self-isolate for a period of 14 days following their arrival in the common travel area. Can I remind members that the committee received a briefing from the department on the SL1 policy proposal for this SR on the 28th of May. Given that the SL1 was incomplete as regards enforcement and other policy detail, the committee decided it was not in a position at that time to support the department making the statutory rule. The Department made the rule on the 5th of June and it came into operation on the 8th of June. SR 2020 forward slash 97 requires operators of commercial transport services bringing passengers to the north from outside the common travel area to provide those passengers with public health information and advise of the requirement to complete a passenger locator form and to self-isolate for 14 days on arrival. The committee was unable to consider the policy proposal for this SR as the SL1 was received after the rule was made. This SR also came into operation on the 8th of June. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on either of these SRs, which are subject to negative resolution. So I'd like to advise members that an official from the Department of Health is here by a video link to brief the committee and to take any questions that you may have in regard to this matter. So I would now like to welcome Miss Elaine Colgan. Chair, could I ask just a small point of order, maybe just yes, in this? And it's just a, I mean, we know that the executive is discussing this now to change what's already presented in front in front of us. I mean, I'm, I'm fearing that if we go into a long session here discussing all these, by the time we exit the meeting, the regulations will have actually changed. And in some respects, the I know that there's the delay behind it, but maybe even if we keep that in mind that. You know, there's a fair chance that what we're discussing now will not, by the end of this meeting, even be relevant. So, but I know we do. It probably does have to go. And does this have to go to the assembly for that positive? Sorry. Negative resolution. A negative resolution. Sorry. Means the committee has the uh, option to seek to annul a regulation with which it's not content within a set period known as the statutory period which at the moment, it depends on how many plenaries, as you were alluding to earlier, but at the moment um, that would, there's a little more time for the committee to come to a view. So um, if you were of the view that your decision today would need to be informed by what was happening later, you possibly would have one more week to make a decision. The, the other thing is my understanding would be that any changes, if I'm right, made at the executive then would be also managed under these statutory regulations. So Get another they're cross, yeah, yeah. They're, they're cross yeah. cutting. I think, yeah. Chair, just now those comments would just be better to, you know, kind of 
draw a line between whatever's happening at the executive, which we're not a part of, yeah. and what we're looking at it right here. We should keep our comments, I think, around what's in front of us and not uh, speculating, I would suggest. It's short, because they're going to be out of date by the end of the meeting. It's <coughs> a fact that it is. Uh, well, I, I do think it is relevant to, to, given that there has been wide public speculation, I think with, with Elaine in front of us, I think it is relevant sure. that we explore issues with her. That's, that's, that's the opportunity that we have. Um, and in relation to, to uh, when you say, well, but I, we'll, we'll talk about that whenever we come back. We'll, we'll go in and, and do the session with Elaine. Elaine, uh, can you hear me there okay? Elaine Colgan? Can you hear me, Elaine? Yes. Yep. Okay, Elaine, you're very welcome to our meeting this morning. Elaine Colgan, Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. Please go ahead and brief the committee, Elaine. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, as you mentioned, uh, good afternoon to the committee, and I'm here today to provide an update on the, the two sets of regulations that you mentioned. And given their interconnectedness, we will obviously take them together. Um, so the, the travel restrictions regulations impose the, the self-isolation requirement and the requirement to provide contact details and any onward travel that a person intends to make and to where they intend to self-isolate on their arrival in Northern Ireland. And this is in order to prevent the spread of infection and contamination. Um, certain people are, are exempt under the regulations and some of those include essential border security, um, diplomats, flight crew and some transport staff. The public health advice regulations are very much connected to those and they impose requirements on transport operators of commercial services to Northern Ireland coming in from outside the travel common area or sorry common travel area to ensure that passengers are provided with the public health information relevant here and also the requirements that they have under those previously mentioned travel restrictions regulations. Information must be provided at the time the person is making the booking, at the time that they check in and while the passengers are on board the vessel or aircraft when it's on its way here. Um, uh, uh, operators who fail to comply with this requirement are subject to a maximum fine of £10,000. So the committee raised a number of issues following our last discussion um, and I would just like to, to focus the remainder of, uh, of my introduction on those issues. Um, so in terms of uh, non-English speaking travellers, the committee asked specifically about uh, how they would be able to be informed of the requirements. Uh, and the passenger locator form, whilst it is only available for completion in English, travellers can complete this at any time within the 48 hours prior to the journey, which gives them some time to find uh, assistance if they need it, if they're non-English speaking. In addition to that, there is a helpline for travellers that they can phone uh, if they require assistance either in completion of the form or if uh, have questions about what the requirements are for self-isolation. And that helpline is advertised on the website right beside the form. Um, in addition, um, Border Force have also um, been providing physical help at the UK ports of entry for those who are arriving and haven't been aware of the requirements and haven't completed the form. Uh, to address translation needs in Northern Ireland specifically, uh, we are working with the Public Health Agency and organisations with which work with non-English speaking communities here to provide information in a format that's accessible to them, and that's including the use of digital media where we can make that available. And an easy read version has also been developed. There was a further query with regard to the interaction with the Northern Ireland Track and Trace Programme run by the PHA. And I just want to clarify, the PHA will have access to the data which is stored by the Home Office should they need it for obtaining contact details for the purposes of contact tracing. Another issue which the committee uh, requested clarification on was accommodation, and specifically um, those who were coming to Northern Ireland and didn't have means um, with which they were able to pay for accommodation that they needed. Um, so initially, um, Border Force had confirmed prior to regulations coming in that they were able to provide accommodation free of charge for symptomatic passengers in Northern Ireland. And recently, they have also begun work to look at the provision of accommodation for those without funds who are non-symptomatic, and that work is ongoing. In terms of Northern Ireland specific work, we do continue to work with PHA again regarding the impact of self-isolation on those in the community who may be living in houses of multiple occupancy. Um, and that was sort of around the same issue um, that the, the committee was raising. And finally, um, I just want to mention the first review of the regulations, which took place on the 29th of June as required. And at that point, it was agreed uh, that the regulations were still required. 
Uh, the next review is due by the 20th of July. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions the committee might have. Okay, thank you. Again. And I suppose the first, the first question they have is in relation to, and, and obviously there is there has been speculation around the uh, the chief medical officer identifying that passengers from England could could uh, prevent the greatest risk in terms of transmission of the disease here. If there were changes being made at the executive level, would those be managed under these regulations similarly? If restrictions were being imposed, or would that require new regulations? Um, I, these regulations could be amended to reflect any changes the executive wanted to make if the travellers were coming into Northern Ireland from anywhere outside of that. Okay, um, I want to move on then to the review on the 29th of June. What was the outcome of that review? What were, what were the figures that were, that were being uh, fed back in? Um, the the review uh, looked at the information. It looked at the scientific evidence of the the spread of the virus at the moment, um, and came to the conclusion that the the regulations were still a proportionate response to the situation here, and that they were still required. Okay, and given given the issue of border force um, being sort of involved at at the at the outset of this. Are there any concerns around uh, people being reluctant to engage, given that it's not a public health kind of response or, or public? Is that is that a particular difficulty for communities, say, who are coming here, foreign national communities who are coming here to work? Has there been any evidence in relation to how those communities are being engaged with in terms of reassurance around the fact that border force are the ones looking after that, and also the fact that this information is being held? And, and, and to me, it's inexplicable as to why it's being held within the Home Office and not a health, not being held within the health department here. As a health, these are health measures to to maintain public health. So, can you explain that to us? Yeah, certainly. So, um, we, I, I, there hasn't been any feedback to the department of people who have been reluctant um, to to comply with the measures. Um, the the border force involvement is. It is because the the border measures or the, the border itself and the enforcement of the border isn't a default issue. So the information being collected is being collected by border force on our behalf because they have they're the first sort of point of entry at which someone will encounter in the UK. Um, it is accessible to the public health agency as I mentioned, and it's also um, PSNI are. I'm going to, to, to be able to access that for enforcement as well. Okay, and finally then from me, in terms of uh, it, there, there are no reciprocal arrangements, data sharing arrangements in place with the 26 counties, although we have a fair amount of travel back and forward. Um, so can, can you update us in terms of the memorandum of understanding and how that data sharing is being progressed? Uh, given that given that we need to be prepared to deal with further surges in the best possible way for the population here, so can you give us an update on that? Certainly. Um, so in terms of data sharing with the site, yes, you're right. For the travel regulations, there's no data sharing, but I would like to just reinforce that for if there's any need to share data for contact tracing purposes, there are systems and mechanisms in place to do that. So if information came to light of a particular outbreak on a form of transport that was arriving into Dublin and information needed to be shared for contact tracing purposes, those mechanisms are in place to do that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go across to members now. I'm going first of all to Paula and then I'll be going to Orlea, who has indicated on the telecoms, and then Jerry. Paula. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, my, my question was around the exemptions um, within the. Uh, you, you've talked about flight crew, road haulage, seasonal workers. Uh, wh why were they picked out in the first place? And is there any other measures that are going to be put in place around, for example, testing or, or other guidance to them about how they can keep safe? I'm just conscious that some of them, like the road haulage, they may well have travelled great distance and come in contact with a lot of people. So, you know, is there not a concern that they could be carriers? Um, yes. Yeah, so, at the outset of the regulations, there was uh, input for all of the four devolved administrations in terms of the exemptions that would apply, uh, and there was information gathered as to how many people that would be exempt from each of those categories, um, and and a risk sort of assessment profiles on on that basis. Uh, there, none of them were massive numbers, and 
you mentioned Root Haulage specifically. Um, it, you know, whales, whilst they travel for their interactions with uh, their close interactions with people are, are quite limited. Um, so, and, it, and yes, it feeds into the second point of your question actually around information and provision of information around testing. Um, and just in, in the longer term for these regulations, testing is, is something that we are looking at and, and the, the Chief Scientific Officer and the Chief Medical Officer are considering um, as further evidence comes forward in that to see if there is a way to look at testing as part of this as well. Okay, and so that's really my second point then, and it, it relates to Colm's issue. Um, uh, he mentioned there around um, people coming in from England, and I'm just wondering, uh, are there any talks or is there any way that we can be looking at our ports and airports, um, actually looking at testing for people arriving from parts of the UK where there are spikes and clusters? Um, and yes, I think uh, consideration is being given to, to that type of approach um, uh, once we um, get to a place where the evidence is in place for testing for travellers. Uh, I'm sorry, is it, your, is it the Chief Medical Officer is leading on that? Um, alongside the Chief Scientific Officer, they're both looking at. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going now on the telephone to Arlea. Arlea, are you there? Sorry, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Arlene, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Um, so Colin had already touched on the issue um, around the, the data process with the, the 26 counties, but I just want to expand on that a wee bit and maybe just to find out, um, has there been any sort of formal meetings or communication with the South in relation to, to the, the travel restrictions and the regulations that, that we're putting into place? I know there was a response to an assembly question that it came through saying that some of this was being discussed um, at meetings, but I'm just conscious, obviously, between North and South, we are taking different um, approaches. That's just my first question, Elaine, if you have any detail on that. And then the second one is, um, do you know how many people arriving into or from the North have actually filled out um, these public health passenger locator forms? And do we have a sense yet of what the, the compliance rate has been like? Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, the first question there on, on data sharing with the South in the meeting. So, the, the travel regulations are they, they come up at the, the the meetings between the two chief medical officers on their meetings under the MOU, um, and those would be the more formal meeting. The, there is uh, informal meetings that I am involved in with my colleagues in the south as well, and they would take place on a more regular basis. But they are more ho ad hoc or not formal. They're really just up to date that we have uh, catch up meetings just to make sure that we're both aware of what each other are doing. Uh, in terms of the passenger locator form, today I have numbers arrived for those in Northern Ireland who filled in. I don't. Um, at this point, we're not able to split the the number of the, the data splitting isn't in place yet. Um, and Border Force are working on that to be able to give us some more specific Northern Ireland um, numbers. Uh, but at this point, I don't have a figures on the number of filling in the passenger locator form from Northern Ireland. So it is difficult then to estimate the compliance rate. Thank you. Orlea, do you have a second question there? No, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, um, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's an element of necessity for these measures, but I mean, I have a few concerns. Um, like, like the chair, I mean, this is a public health issue. I don't know why Home Office is storing this data. This raises massive questions uh, for me and, and others. Uh, so, a bit of clarity, if we can, on that. Uh, there's also what uh, the CAGA have referred to as the Donegal question. Um, I understand there's somebody arriving in Dublin, uh, but travels to Donegal, has to fill out a, a UK form, what's called a, a UK locator form. Uh, can you confirm if that's the case and uh, why? Uh, and finally, um, I think there's still a concern about racial profiling and how these um, fines may be issued and handed out. I mean, there's the whole question around Black Lives Matter um, here, but also in, in England. 50, uh, if you're a BAME uh, community member, you're 54%. You're more likely to be fined than, than you are a white person in England. So what measures are in place to ensure that this isn't used to racial profile, to target people who are minority backgrounds, um, which you know, has been in the case uh, in other uh, areas and jurisdictions? What specific measures are in place to prevent that from happening? Thank you. 
Okay. Um, just to, the, the only thing I can really add on the Home Office storing the data to my previous answer was that there is, me there is measures in place that the data is deleted quite quickly, so it's only held for the length of time that's needed, which I understand to be two cycles of the incubation period. Um, so it's not held on a long-term basis. Um, the Donegal question, yes. Um, so yes, if someone is driving from Dublin to Donegal through Ireland on their way, having been in, a, in another country outside of the common travel area for the last 14 days, they are required to self-isolate um, and fill in the form when they come to the north. Um, self-isolation doesn't really apply because you can leave the north to get out of your self-isolation, if that makes sense. You're, you are permitted to leave the north. Um, but yes, they would technically be required to fill in the passenger locator form on the right at Donegal. Um, the racial profiling, um, I, can't, I can't speak for the case in England. Um, I, I can outline here how the enforcement um, process is intended to operate. So there's a contractor that the public health agency have in place who are conducting sample calls based on the number of UK arrivals to verify if people are self-isolating and to provide them with some public health information and um, to give them advice on symptoms and if, to direct them for testing if they are symptomatic. Uh, if those calls, if the people that are making those calls have any concerns um, about the, that they think the person might not be self-isolating as they're required to do, they can then pass that information onwards to police authorities. Um, it's not intended that these that on this the, the enforcement would be on the street without having there been previous information being provided to someone that would have been agnostic. No, no one providing that information would really have known um, necessarily the racial profiling only the country they've come from. Does that provide any reassurance? Yeah, but I just. <laughs> Um, not clear on the measures to prevent racial profiling. To be, to be frank, you know, um, I've I've got your your point about the intention is, but often there's good intentions, but the practice is, you know, minority communities are disproportionately targeted through lots of um, things such as such as fines. So I think there's still a concern there, and I think it needs to be addressed in detail. Um, Elaine, can I can I ask just in uh, in relation to the risk assessments that are carried out? So we're we're advised that the uh, the British government are looking at risk assessments, and I think part of that assessment is based on countries who have a similar or a lower rate of transmission that would be allowed that would be potentially considered as opening up an air bridge. Um, given that given that currently in in England and Wales rates of transmission or rates of, of positive tests in the community are running around about 11 or 10 per million of population and that here in in the north i think it's around about two that figure as opposed to approximately 10. i think that's similar in the 26 counties and similar in scotland can we be assured that the decision making here will reflect the rates of the rates of new positive tests here rather than a rather than an aggregate of what's happening maybe in other parts um, yes, so quite right. Um, we are working to make sure that any decisions that are taken are based on specific Northern Ireland data. Uh, and going forward, we are trying to put mechanisms in place to enable us to actually get more data on the types of arrivals that are coming in, um, either via Dublin or directly or via the UK, and where they're coming from. Um, so we're, we're actively working with our statistician colleagues and, and others um, to try and get more information, which will enable a, a more tailored risk assessment for Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. I have an indication from Pat Sheehan on the phone. Yeah, Pat. Yes, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Elaine. Um, Elaine, uh, I, I'm just wondering the modelling done of the number of travellers that we would be talking about coming in into the north here. Uh, do you have any figures around that? We have monthly figures on the number of direct flights coming in, um, but we don't have that broken down by country. Uh, so that's that's what we're working on, trying to get more granularity around. Um, and we would hope to have that quite soon and able to feed that into the next review. 
that there, there does seem to be a lot of uncertainty around the numbers and around exemptions. You know, uh, someone who has been in the UK within the past week coming in here is exempt uh, from from uh, from filling in the form, is it? Or is it from self-isolation? From, sorry, I'm not following the, the question. From someone arriving from the UK that, that has been abroad? Uh, let, let me just read you. They're exempt from self-isolating, but still have to fill in the contact and uh, travel details. So that's uh, clause 37, is it? Is that for the exempted countries that England have introduced? Or uh, uh, an employed or self-employed person in the United Kingdom who resides in another country to which they usually return at least once a week? Um, so, Northern Ireland in the oh. current... If, the, the reading that you're the reading there, Northern Ireland has current exemption for employed or self-employed persons yeah. who reside in the country. Yeah, that's in our regulations at the moment. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I suppose the point I'm making is that there there seems to be a, a lack of clarity around all of this. You know, about the numbers who are coming in, uh, who who is exempt. The issue that was raised by Jerry there about people travelling to Donegal uh, through the north and so on. Uh, um, and I, I, I suppose. The, the question I really want to ask you is, is in terms of the process for the committee approving these regulations, what, what sort of time scale do we have on that? Because I think we need a, a lot more information around these particular regulations, given how quickly the situation is changing. Um, yeah, so I think um, it was the earlier discussion before I came in was that the exam the regulations are subject to negative resolution, and the, as far as I'm aware, the 28 days haven't run out yet. Um, in terms of clarity and the requirements, there is a information online on NI Direct which provides some information to people um, that on, on what the requirements are for or here and what the exemptions are in place. Uh, we can. I'm happy to take feedback in, and if there's a particular um, area of, of concern that you're aware of or where you think that information needs to be enhanced, we're happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Just, just, just be aware okay. of follow-up. Uh, sorry, sorry, Pat, are you going to come back in there? No, no, that's okay, Chair. I mean, I, I'm just trying to get a handle on the process here uh, as much as anything because I, I'm not particularly clear about these regulations myself and there seems to be a lot of uncertainty around them and I'm just wondering uh, can uh, they, they, they be deferred for some time until we get okay well thanks we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that just as a follow-up to Pat's question there earlier and, and he mentioned modeling and you said there's very little detail on what's happening at the present time but my idea of modelling is that you will be looking at, so we're, we're in the midst of a number of relaxations, all of which are opening up other possibilities in terms of holidays and things like that. So are you modelling what the impact of the relaxations may be on the rates of travel? So I suppose in some ways what I'm saying is there hasn't been much reason to travel where we've been in lockdown as we open up the travel. So are you modelling what the increased rates of travel will be and therefore what the potential increased rates of transmission from any given source might be? Um, so yes, the Chief Scientific Officer Chair is a, a group that um, looks at the modelling of all of the things that you mentioned. I'm not over the detail of that because I'm not involved in that work, but I, I do know that it's part of his consideration. Okay, um, I'm going now to Pam. Thank you, and thank you, Elaine, for your attendance at the committee today. Um, Elaine, has the department designated an authorised person for uh, purposes of enforcing social isolation? Uh, no, we just got the PSMI as the enforcers. Okay, so we're really just trusting people to do the right thing in that yes. circumstance where they need to self-isolate. Yeah, Alu, if they've come through a UK port, they will they will be part of the sample calling process. 
so sample calling that they may or may not get a call to say are you complying yeah. with the self isolation yeah. and it's yeah. really taken on trust then that we're okay and I don't know I suppose I mean my concern is understand it's very difficult to place these issues and ensure that guidance is being followed but I suppose you know given recent events um, if this executive isn't providing the leadership in in actually adhering to guidance and to rules and to laws where you know where do we go from here when we're you know making new laws and when we're uh, relaxing relaxing um, regulations or indeed stepping forward or step stepping back I, you know how can we ask the public to actually to adhere to any of these regulations if we're not setting the example of doing just that at government level. Um, I'm not really sure what I can uh, can say to respond to that, other than um, if the, the police are aware by any means, by any way, of someone who is in breach of their self isolation requirement, they can be fined up to a thousand pounds. So, as the primary way of them finding out about that will be through the sample calling service. If anyone is concerned, they can contact the PSNI themselves. So, so for people who, if you know, say that, that somebody has travelled from outside the common travel area and uh, that they should be self-isolating and you know that they're not self-isolating, how do you go about reporting that? Do you report that directly to PSNI or where does that go to? I understand there is a mechanism for that, yes. Maybe follow that up and, and provide the mechanism. Yeah, yes. yeah. I can find that out. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Colin. Thank you very much for the presentation. And then, Elaine, could I start off by asking if the department could send you here for every presentation? Your answers are short, straight to the point, and it really is a breath of fresh air because we normally get about five minutes of waffle around every uh, answer that we get. So it's been a breath of fresh air, and thank you for it. Um, my question you, you may or may not be able to answer, but it relates to um, many people are contacting us saying that they've got holidays booked. Um, and I know that given the restrictions have changed in England, that has changed the foreign, uh, foreign Office, their designation of whether countries can be travelled to or not. That often is the deciding factor as to whether you can claim on your holiday insurance. But if here in uh, Northern Ireland we say, no, you can't go to certain places or that there is uh, restrictions in place which mean that the travel is impossible, yet the Foreign Office actually, their website says that it is safe to travel to those places, um, do you think that there's a chance that the insurance companies will start to renege on paying out, or is there a way that that can be um, covered um, so that people can get their money back if they're not able to travel? Um, I'm not overly familiar with the in insurance industry, but the situation that you've described is, is accurate. Um, the, I guess there's two things. The first is that we're not saying people can't travel. We're saying that when they come back, they should self-isolate for 14 days. And I appreciate there are obviously implications that people need to take into consideration then whether they want to travel given that requirement. Um, and I guess, I suppose, the advice that I would maybe give to people is that make your insurance company fully aware of the requirements in your jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't think there are any other questions from members, Elaine, so I'd like to thank you um, for your for your answers you. there. Um, and I suppose um, just to, to wish you all the best and thank you for briefing the committee today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Okay, members, um, so any thoughts or... Any thoughts on that section? Sure, could, could, just on the point that I've raised there, could we write to the Executive Office, the First and Deputy First Minister, and ask them if they've given consideration to making changes to the regulations that differ from the changes in London and whether that will impact people's capacity to, to claim on their insurance? Because if we say that people must take a two-week quarantine when they return from a week in France or a week in Spain or wherever, and it means that travel isn't possible, 
but yet the Foreign Office says that travel to those places is safe because they have changed. They said you shouldn't travel. They now have changed the saying that you must, you can travel. But our executive is saying no, you can't, or, or that it will be impossible to travel because you have to do two weeks quarantine when you return. I mean, I can see thousands of people across Northern Ireland losing out on insurance claims, which could could really cost people thousands of pounds. So I think it's a consideration that we should clarify at least and, and hope that it's not the case. Perfect. Do you think that's something that we can do? Yeah, I'll, I'll look into drafting something for the committee to look at. And in light, in light of the in light of the concerns and the, the fluidity of the situation, um, we could defer this until the twenty third of July. Um, would members be content that we can, and it will then allow us to factor in any other changes that are being made? Would members be content? Broadly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, members content on the phone? I think yes. Okay. Okay. We'll defer that till the twenty third. Sure. I agree. Can I, can I ask a question and, and a proposal, if possible? In regards to I think the racial profile aspect of this is quite uh, concerning and uh, severe. Um, I don't know if it's if it's the PSNI or the Department of Public Two, which seeking some uh, guidance and clarity on on the fact that racial profiling will not be used in terms of the implementation uh, of these procedures. So. Uh, can we write to somebody, and who would it be the, the most appropriate body that to write to? Um, what, what, just what, what's your proposal, Jerry? What's your concern in terms of who it is that is it the, the PSNA in terms of research or the Border Force? Well, it's both, to be frank. Um, I, I don't know if we can write to the Border Force as a health committee, or what's the, the arrangement in terms of the setup here? Is it the, the DOJ, or I don't know who that is, to be completely honest with you, Chair, but I, I'm just concerned that you know, these powers could be, and emphasis could be used you know, disproportionately towards uh, BAME people. That's, that's a concern not just by me, that's raised by other people. So I just think if we can get some guidance as to how that will not be the practice, I think that would be helpful for us as a committee. Well, I, I wasn't very clear from the answers in terms of uh, how often this had been applied or types of numbers, or, or was there a breakdown in terms of where people were travelling from in terms of numbers or whatever. So maybe that's that's one maybe piece of information we could seek in terms of how is it being implemented. And now I'm talking about from the Department of Health as as for our next for our next consideration of this is how it's actually being implemented in practice. So that's one suggestion that I would have in relation to that, Alex. Can I get a clip? What, can you explain this to me again? This, what do you think is happening? Cause well, what could happen? I mean, we've got uh, separate issues. We've had UK government having powers to stop and search, to find people for different reasons, and has been used disproportionately against minority communities. So I'm saying, what guidance do we have <coughs> in place to ensure that these fines aren't being disproportionately used against people from minority communities. I think it's far enough to ask that question. I'm not saying that's definitely happening. I'm saying what's the guidance in place to make sure that it doesn't happen. I think it's a fair question to ask and a fair... Um, so you've no proof that it is happening here, but... You I'm asking the question, just, yeah. yeah. How, how, do we protect, how do we protect ourselves from what happened and minority communities from it being used uh, disproportionately towards them? I think it's a fair point to ask. Yeah, and I think I think I think it is fair to ask what guidance is in place. And again, I think that's probably the Department of Health. So could we would we agree to write to the Department of Health asking for how it's being how, how this is working out in practice in terms of how many times they're intervening or how many times they're following up those types of figures and also what guidance is in place to guard against potential? Yep, I would be content. Would members be agreed with that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, we have decided then to defer both of those both of those SRs to the twenty third of July. Um, that being the case, we will then be moving on, but I think we may need to take a short break in order, order to get the next official on the line. Would it be right in St. Clark? We don't have. So we're going to take a short break now just to get the official on the line for the next set of SRs. Okay, we do have an uh, official has joined us now, and so we're able now to move on to the next section, which is section 8 and 9. Section 8 is SR 2020 forward slash 121. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 9, Regulations NA 2020. And also Agenda Item 9, which is SR 2020-128. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 10, Regulations NA 2020. So members, I would propose that we take these two agenda items together and I refer you to the papers at tabs 8 and 9 of your pack. 
The Department has made two further statutory rules under the Emergency Procedure of the Public Health Act 1967 to provide for further easements of restrictions. The Department has advised that, due to the urgency of the situation addressed by the SRs, there was no time to bring SL1s to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has not yet reported these SRs, which are both subject to the confirmatory procedure and are scheduled for debate in the Assembly on the 21st of July. Can I advise members that a departmental official has joined us via video link to brief the committee on the regulations? So I'd like now to welcome back once again Mr Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Officer. Nigel, are you there and can you hear us okay? Yes, Chair, um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear there, Nigel. So please go ahead and brief the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made and brought into operation on the 28th of March. The need for the restrictions and requirements in the regulations are required to be reviewed at least every 21 days. Uh, the committee will be aware that it's a requirement of the principal regulations and as soon as the Department of Health considers that any of the restrictions or requirements set out in the regulations are no longer required or necessary to prevent or protect against the spread of coronavirus disease, that they should be withdrawn. And just to remind the committee, um, in terms of the process, the proposals for change are brought forward by departments and considered as part of an exe agreed executive decision-making framework that includes guiding principles, a risk and benefit assessment model, and a structured process for assessing and implementing, modifying, or withdrawing specific restrictions and requirements. Decisions to introduce, withdraw, or amend existing restrictions or requirements have been implemented either through public messaging, through guidance, or by legislative change involving amendments to the principal regulations, or in some cases, a mixture of all three of these things. There have now been 10 sets of amendment regulations made that give effect to the executive decisions on the continuing need for the restrictions and the requirements, and the committee is today uh, considering amendment regulations numbers 9 and 10. So SR 2020, number 121, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendments number 9 regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The amendment number 9 regulations were made on the 29th of June and were commenced at 11 p.m. on the 29th of June. And these regulations allow for gatherings of up to 30 people in public places and outdoors. SR 2020, number 128, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment number 10, regulations Northern Ireland 2020, um, were made on the 2nd of July. And the various changes that they introduce have a number of different commence commencement dates associated with them. So in summary, the six main changes introduced are to permit the reopening of museums, galleries, and betting shops from the 3rd of July to permit the reopening of businesses offering massage, tattooing and piercing from the 6th of July, to permit the reopening of spas from the 6th of July, but not insofar as they provide services related to water or steam, um, to permit the restricted opening of restaurants and bars in registered clubs from the 3rd of July, to ensure that funerals are no longer restricted to close family or friends, and to allow for attendance at summer schools or summer schemes. So thank you to the committee for um, listening and to agreeing to uh, continue the latest sets of amendment regulations today. I'm happy to try and answer any uh, questions that the committee may have. Okay, Nigel, thank you very much for that. And I have to say it's good to see you once again, rather than just hearing you, as we have done over a number of weeks. But, but thank you for that. I'm going to go across uh, straight over to our Deputy Chair here, Pam Cameron. Thank you, Nigel. Yes, good to see you. Um, Nigel, can you um, give me some information? Um, obviously, we've had an awful lot of controversy, let's put it mildly, um, in the last number of days around um, the, the funeral of, uh, of Bobby's story on Tuesday the 30th. Can you give us um, the detail of um, the provision um, that was in place on the 30th of June uh, that applies to organisation and attendance of funerals? Um, yes, indeed. At the 
time of the funeral, the restriction regulations provided a reasonable excuse for a person to leave their home to attend a funeral of a member of the person's household, a close family member, or if no member of the household or close family can attend, a friend may attend. Does that answer the question? Um, yes, it does. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Alan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Nigel, just uh, we, we talked about uh, in, in your preamble the urgency of uh, of getting particularly this uh, amendment number nine uh, through, and it wasn't time to, uh, to meet the usual protocols. Um, I note that uh, the uh, act was made at 9:30 p.m. on Monday, the 29th of June, uh, was led before the assembly the next morning at 9 a.m. But it came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 29th of June 2020, an hour and a half after it was made. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, what would be what would create such urgency uh, to amend. Uh, it has the effect of amending gatherings from 10 people to 30. What was the absolute pressing urgency? Uh, for this sort of time scale. It's a bit unusual, I would have thought, for lawmakers to be sitting at 9.30 at night making laws and bringing them into operation at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, I would have thought that a, a, a start of a day rather than the time during the day would be the time to bring a new law into operation. And logistically, would this have presented difficulties for the PSNI who are charged with the responsibility of policing regulations? that if a police officer uh, at 1 minute the 11 on the 29th of June had witnessed a gathering in excess of 10 people, that officer could have intervened. But at 1 minute past 11, that officer uh, would not have had uh, the legal authority to intervene. Uh, so how would, uh, I mean, how do you accommodate the police being able to deal with that situation? A police officer going on duty, say, for instance, at tea time on the Monday and finishing at midnight or just after midnight, how would the information, how would you expect the police to relay that information to every police officer out on the ground that at exactly 11 o'clock uh, you don't have the authority to challenge uh, uh, any groups of, of more than, than 10 people? It, it just seems a, a, highly, a highly unusual uh, approach. Uh, and, and could you really uh, uh, go back to my question? What was the urgency? What was the pressures? What was the rationale between the urgency of having to change this regulation from 10 to 30? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, well, we've mentioned, uh, I think we, we mentioned every time that we, we, we have these sessions that there's a clear requirement in the regulations to uh, either amend or remove restrictions as soon as. Um, it's appropriate to do so. Um, increasing the number of people that can gather while maintaining social distancing to 30 um, was very much heralded from back in May uh, on the step three of the executive's approach to um, decision making. Um, these are things that are discussed uh, regularly by the, the executive clearly and uh, in common with the approach that we've taken to date in the Department of Health and the legislative um, changes are made just as soon as it's practical to do so after the executive has taken such a decision. So um, the executive took the decision on that particular issue um, uh, um, on that date, um, and the department then were, uh, were were asked then to to make the amendment to the regulations um, to take effect. In terms of the actual timings uh, in the evening, um, whilst I wasn't involved personally, I think there might have been logistical issues that night, just simply in terms of getting um, the, the relevant members of, of uh, staff to be available to, to do the practicalities of actually making and signing and, and registering and laying the regulations and so on. But it would always be our intent to, um, to, to make the regulations as soon as possible following the executive's decisions. And you'll be aware from the previous sets of amendment regulations that on a number of occasions, regulations have been made the same day as um, the executive have taken their decisions. Or there would have been, this would have presented logistical difficulties uh, and potential embarrassment uh, for the PSNI to, you know, to, to change this so quickly. I mean, would you have had 
conversations earlier in the day with the PSNI, uh, informing them that it was your intention at 11 o'clock on the 29th of June to change this regulation? Um, I'm not aware that there would have been any discussions earlier in the day. Um, I wasn't involved in that personally, I have to say. Um, the main communication following the executive's decision would have been the executive um, press release issuing usually shortly after the, the meeting, and obviously that's a public press release. From the Department of Health perspective, um, we do share information on changes that have been made. Um, with PSNI and with the councils um, as soon as possible afterwards, usually the following day, if the um, changes to legislations have been made that evening. Um, so certainly, uh, I don't believe there would have been anything it would have issued from the Department of Health to the, the, the police um, in advance of the change being made. Thank you, Alan. Jerry. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I, have, I have no real issues with the content of, of Amendment Number 9. Um, but I've raised concerns about previous amendments with yourself, Nigel, uh, particularly the ones uh, relating to the 5th of June in relation to the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, events. And we were told that it was just a coincidence that they were made um, the night before the event. Uh, and I'm concerned that um, that approach has been taken around some events that we're being told that it's just a coincidence, but they're being rushed through without really uh, referencing the scientific or medical advice, um, so I think there's a concern uh, around that, um, and that has to be um, addressed. And and is it the case that the, the advice changes, or whether it's a minister or ministers to say that uh, things should change, why amendments are made? So I think there's an open question around that. I think uh, around amendment number ten, uh, I have some concerns um, around moving too quickly. Um, I, I've made this repeatedly. You'll you'll be aware, Nigel. I'm concerned that people are being forced back to work. Uh, whether there are still health and safety concerns, whether there's still a furlough uh, scheme existing, uh, and given the current uh, possibility of clusters in Crosscar, uh, the uh, news around Leicester moving back into lockdown, parts of Germany and, and other parts of the world, I'm concerned once again that we're moving uh, too quickly again. Uh, so, in regard to those recent events, uh, cross car possibility of clusters, uh, uh, Leicester moving into lockdown and other areas, has the medical, uh, has the scientific advice uh, been updated? Uh, and if so, uh, what is it? Well, scientific uh, and medical advice is uh, pretty much always under constant review, and um, we, I think we've said on a number of occasions, both the chief medical officer and chief scientific advisor are linked into various um, sources and groups that, that discuss that all the time. Um, in terms of the local lockdowns, we are very closely monitoring what's happening in, in uh, Leicester. Uh, there, is, uh, the, there are regulations that have been brought in specifically to implement um, changes in, in, in Leicester. Effectively, uh, I believe they reintroduce previous restrictions um, uh, for a geographical area that includes um, most of most of Leicester. So we're monitoring to see how that actually plays out. Um, in conjunction with that, we're also looking at a fairly significant and radical overhaul of the regulations. The committee know better than most uh, how difficult they've become to navigate with 10 sets of amendments now and, and undoubtedly more, more to come. Uh, that has led to, we acknowledge some anomalies and some consistence, inconsistencies. Um, it's also quite difficult for the public, I think, to understand quite where we are now on various um, uh, on various things. So one of the things the department wants to bring to the executive um, uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, is a plan to um, review and refresh the regulations so that they start to uh, become clearer to all on what on um, what's not allowed um, uh, now, given that most things have been relaxed but also to have some consideration about um, local lockdowns. And is that something in a Northern Ireland context we would see ourselves doing? Um, and from my perspective, in terms of the legislation, how would, how would the legislation help to enforce or to underpin that? Uh, you know, how would that actually work? So that's something we're talking to uh, colleagues and um, our legal advisors on in terms of what might that look like and how might that work. Um, it's very much in our minds at the moment, and we do plan to bring something um, more concrete on that to the executive in the near future. Uh, Colin. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Nigel, for your update. If we can go to Amendment Number Ten first, um, and just further to, to Pam's question, if on Tuesday of last week there was a funeral and a person, if there was family members at that funeral, would that mean that people that were not family members that did attend it were not sticking to the regulations? And just for clarity, then, can I ask you if they? didn't do that, is that breaking a regulation, breaking a requirement, breaking the guidance, or breaking the law? Um, I think the, the member is, is correct in his assessment. Um, if family members were in attendance, um, then those who, who are not a um, family member or a p person household um, should not have attended, and that would be would have been a breach of the the regulations. Um, in terms of the Department of Health's guidance for funeral directors, um, which is relevant here as well, then there, uh, there would have been a, a number of aspects um, reported in the media that um, potentially wouldn't have complied um, with the guidance either, um, particularly in respect of uh, the body of the deceased having been taken home, um, a public wake having been held and uh, coffin lifts having taken place. And when you say that there's a breach of the regulations, the regulations are formed under the law, so that's a break of the law, which is punishable in what way? Uh, well, the, the, the PSNI in this case, uh, as the uh, regulator, would have had a number of options available um, in, turn, in terms of things like directing people to disperse, directing people to return home, um, and if necessary, to um, issue fixed penalty notices. And in terms of regulation number nine, that's the one that extended it from 10 to 30. Um, again, under the guidelines that's there, um, if there are 30 people, is there a requirement under the legislation and regulations for them to be socially distancing? Uh, no, that's, that's really just general guidance. Uh, the regulations only require um, uh, that no more than 30 people gather in a place, um, and gather is generally considered to mean um, be in one place for the same common purpose. Um, the regulations in that respect don't refer to social distancing specifically. And then you've got, you had my next sort of element, which was how do you define 30? I mean, if there was, uh, I mean, we had events back in, in June and we had events last week where there was uh, more than that. At what point does, you know, how, how do you define that there's more than 30? And again, is that just a general acceptance or is that specifically referred to in the regulations that? You know, defining when it becomes more than 30 people, or is it just 30 in a particular spot and 20 metres away there's another 30 and 30 metres away there's another 30? At what point does that number uh, become more than 30? Yes, I think that is a good point, and it is a difficulty with using numbers uh, in, in the legislation. Um, the regulations require refer to up to up to 30, so in that sense, 30 is a limit. Um, it's further complicated by the fact that that, of course, uh, you know, members of the same household um, can meet together and not are not socially distanced. So, uh, you know, from an enforcement point of view, um, I do have some sympathies for the for the police in trying to enforce that in the sense of trying to determine which um, a group of people um, is not from the same household and are gathering together. There's no there's no doubt that that is is quite a difficult thing. Um, so we are moving into territory where we're very much relying on the uh, public and on, on, on citizens on the basis of the messaging that they've received and their understanding to do the right thing and to comply. Um, so um, by this stage, we would hope that most people would be aware that they shouldn't be arranging to meet and to gather um, in, in groups of more than 30. Um, there's no, no particular reason for um, 30 as such other than that was the, state, the next stage in um, uh, the executive's plan in terms of allowing people to, to get together. And again, that may, that may well change um, to a bigger number in the future. And just finally, is there, is there a point in terms of, um, is there any special guidance under the regulations for people that are organising events? 
Uh, is there any special checklists that they must do? Is there a requirement that if they're sending text messages to invite people that they do so uh, in a way that doesn't breach the regulations? Do they have to have special um, risk assessments done in terms of that? Or is it just general that if they organise it, they should be taking into consideration the regulations? Um, well, all I would really say on guidance is that we, we, we've mentioned that many of these uh, changes now are coming forward from different departments. And uh, one of the things departments need to do when they're bringing forward the proposal is indicate whether they feel that um, guidance is required um, to support the change that they make and indeed to give a sort of an indicative timeline for when that guidance might be in place. So um, the landscape has become quite complicated now. It's very difficult for, certainly, certainly for me, to, to keep abreast of um, what guidance has been produced, in what context, or which situation. Um, from the Department of Health's point of view, as an example, we've already referred to the guidance that was made available to funeral directors, and it, and it does contain quite um, reasonably detailed advice um, about how to, to arrange matters in relation to a funeral and what um, could happen and what shouldn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Paula. Um, um, very quickly. Uh, I suppose at this stage now, with so many um, easements in the regulations, they, you're still putting forward around only leaving home without reasonable excuse for these events. So I, I think we're probably getting to the point now where there should be a list of things that you can't do as opposed to what you can. And, and that leads me on the specific question then around um, Pilates and yoga instructors. Are they able to operate under these regulatory amendments or are they having to wait for the gyms or a subsequent announcement? It's just, there's still confusion out there for constituents and business owners as to who can operate and because the, the, the lists are not that definitive. Yes, I would agree. Um, for, for, first of all, I would agree with, with, uh, with your first point, uh, Paula, about um, Regulation 5 and the excuses to leave home. And that's very something we've, we've begun to, to recognise um, a while ago and is likely to be, I think, central to our restructuring of the regulations that we're, we have an ever-growing list of reasons why you can leave home and uh, we probably in the not too distant future need to, to flip that around and get to a position where we can be clear about what's left that you can't do if you wish. Um, it's hard to think of anything now that you can't leave home to do, um, which arguably then potentially makes that regulation somewhat redundant. So that's something we're aware of and something that we're looking at. In terms of the queries about particular types of businesses and premises being open, that too is difficult because of the very wide, wide range of activity that goes on. And I, I, I appreciate and have every sympathy for um, people who aren't maybe quite sure if their particular type of activity isn't specifically mentioned. I would say that um, the department, and I'm sure other departments, but the Department of Health certainly receives a significant number of such queries um, pretty much on a daily basis asking for clarification um, and we, we do seek to reply to those just as soon as we're able to given the, the other pressures and the volume of things that, um, that come in. In terms of things like, um, I think it was maybe yoga. Uh, dance, studio and yoga and so on, yeah, yeah. Um, indoor and indoor uh, gyms is, is something that's clearly, you know, um, uh, still under consideration um, and you might reasonably expect to hear something on that very, very soon. Um, and, and hopefully in the communications around that, we'll, we'll be able to make it clear just um, what sort of activities are involved in that. But I, but I would agree with the general principle that we probably need now to move to um, more general descriptions of types of activity and, and being clear about the detail of what you can't do, um, rather than, than being very, you know, in an attempt to be helpful and being very specific, uh, it seems to raise more questions at times than it answers, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And finally, Alex. Um, just to clarify with me, the new social distancing rules are you have to be a metre apart, isn't that correct? Well, it's maintained uh, two metres, except where that's not possible. Um, and then as, as much as possible, but no less than a metre. Okay, so if there were 30 gathered together at a, some event, they do need to be one metre at the two, at the very least, apart? Yeah. Well, I would say if it's in a, if it's in a, uh, a scenario where achieving two metres is, is perfectly possible, then it should really be two metres. 
I think um, the change in advice to one meter was really reflecting that in some situations, such as um, indoors, in premise, in some premises where space is restricted, or indeed on things like public transport, where at times two meters might not be available, uh, or, or sorry, possible, um, then then uh, one one meter or, or more um, would, would be the best best advice. So anyone closer than the one meter, depending on the circumstances, is really breaking the rules, and that's the bottom line. Would that be correct? Well, it's certainly, it's kind of, it's certainly contrary to the uh, to the advice. As far as the regulations are concerned. The only current specific reference to social distancing is in respect of um, a graveyard where the regulations or a burial ground, where the regulations require the, uh, the owners uh, to ensure the two meter social distancing between um, those uh, uh, attending a graveyard. It's the only, the only place in the regulations where social distancing is specifically mentioned. So you sort of raised a point there. So at the graveyard, at the, the funeral we've been discussing, the the owners of that graveyard would have had to ensure that people kept a two, two, two metre distance. Yeah. Um, the, that, that's what the regulation require. And of course, the, um, the, the, the 30 persons in the gathering would also be relevant in that scenario. Yeah. OK, well, that obviously didn't happen. And just one last question. Um, in terms of the department, did anyone from that funeral, the organisers, contact yourself or the department to ask for advice on any of these social distancing issues or, or relevant issues to do with that particular funeral? Did they seek advice from you? What could be done um, or not done? I can only really say that I, I, I didn't receive any requests for advice and I'm not, not aware of of any, um, but clearly, you know, the, uh, other colleagues in the department, and I, I couldn't be definitive on whether anybody else might have been contacted. But not yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nigel, and thank you for. I think I think you're acknowledged that the state's expertise around these. <laughs> uh, they, they are they are as clear as mud to some degree. But if anyone knows them, you do. And I suppose we have some th sympathy for the fact that that they have become. Um, you know, in, in in the overlapping easements and that there has become issues there. So I suppose we, we look forward to seeing what the department are proposing in terms of in terms of next steps with that. But thank you for your contribution today as ever and all the best for the future, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair and members and the, the same to yourselves. Okay, thank you. Mr Chairman, I wonder if I could come in at this point. Um, yes. We've heard very clearly uh, from the officer uh, of what constituted a breach of the regulations and the law and the guidance uh, at the funeral uh, last Tuesday. And I think it would be common knowledge within the committee that two members of the health committee did attend that uh, funeral, uh, and that is their, uh, entirely their right to do so. Uh, but I feel that given the fact that this committee is charged with the responsibility of scrutinising uh, all the various agencies involved. I think also the public would have an expectation that we would scrutinise within our own numbers. Uh, and I would like to put a proposal on the floor, Mr Chairman, that this committee disassociates itself uh, from the actions of members of this committee who attended that funeral, which quite clearly uh, did breach uh, a, a vast number of the regulations and the guidance. Well, I'm I'm honestly not aware of who attended the funeral. I have to say, um, in that respect, uh, other members' views. Chair, um, not wishing to contradict you, um, other members were present in this. Well, I'm not sure which room it was last week at the beginning of the meeting when you yourself stated that both Pat Sheehan and Olia Flynn would be dialing in late because they were at the funeral? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I was not 100% sure of that, Pam, I have to say. That is on the record, Mr words. Chairman. Jerry? Um, I, I think it's quite ironic, Chair, that, um, you know, uh, there's questions to be asked, obviously, but a fuss is kicked up about a, an outdoor event, but 
seemingly nothing said about further changes to the regulations that are forcing people back inside, which we know the virus is much more deadly and dangerous. So I think there's a big, big question over, over that. Uh, and I think there's been a, a number of issues uh, that I've raised uh, in regards to that. So I think there's there's big, big questions around that I've raised previously about these regulation changes um, being made the night before uh, Black Lives Matter uh, events. And, uh, you know, se seemingly nothing really done to, to address that in any great sense. And I think that's there's, there's, there, there are big questions still to be raised over that. Um, and I recall no proposals from, from other members in regards to, to that, apart from maybe myself. OK, I have an indication on the phone from Pat Sheehan. Pat? Uh, there's a difficulty here because I'm not sure what uh, evidence um, Alan has that there was any breaches of the regulations uh, by any member of the committee. But could I suggest that if he has any information to that effect, he should bring it to the PSNI and let them investigate it because if there have been breaches of the law, it's the responsibility of the PSNI to investigate it. Uh, it's, not, it's not for this. It's not for this committee. Or am I of it? You, Pat. Chair, can Pat. I ask for clarity that we ask the two members of the committee, um, both Pat and Orlea, if they were in attendance at the funeral last Tuesday? Well, I don't think it's it's the role of the committee to inquire where committee members are. If they if uh, if the, that's entirely up to the members, but I don't think that that's. Um, the role of this committee is to scrutinise where people were on any given day. Well, I would suggest, Chair, that the two members should be given the option of confirming if they were or were not. It's quite an easy question. If they were or were not at the funeral last Tuesday. Well, I give them the option to answer or not answer as they may as they may so choose. And I'm receiving no indications. No Chair, on the phone. Chair, I, I think we could go round, round in circles here, and I don't think it's productive. Um, I think there are structures and, and um, methods within the Assembly to address these matters, and I think it probably would be better to refer them to them rather than to put people on the spot in, in this place. Um, and I mean, I don't know if the committee can write to the Standards Commissioner and ask that that. I mean, to me, there, there, I was clear in my questionings in so far as there are two separate issues. One's a, a breach of regulations, the other is a break, a break to the law, uh, and that was quite clear. Uh, but I don't know. I don't, didn't follow people around to see whether they were at the funeral, but were maybe in the cortege, or they were in the public, but not in the church. I don't know. But I think it would be better to refer it on and let somebody else investigate that rather than put people on the spot here. I don't think that's particularly fair, and I think that's why the structures are in place to refer it to somebody else. So um, I would make that a recommendation that if this committee feels that there are people in the committee that were breaching the law, that they refer it on and ask somebody else to deal with that rather than, than here and now. Yeah, I think that will be, that'll be a, a, a more clear approach. So are members content with that? Uh, well, Mr Chairman, uh, a few weeks ago, I just remind Pat that he did put a similar uh, proposal on the floor in relation to the actions of a member uh, of this committee where he wished the committee to disassociate themselves from that member's action. Uh, so certainly Pat himself has created that uh, precedent. Uh, my proposal is that we simply disassociate ourselves from the actions of any members of this uh, committee who were present at the, uh, at the funeral. And Chair, I would, I would second that proposal. I'm not making any allegations or saying that they should be publicly whipped or whatever. I'm simply saying I wish to disassociate myself as a member of this committee with the actions of any member of this committee who did attend that funeral. Well, I don't recall us having taken any decision to disassociate from, from any particular... You will um, recall it put on the floor, Mr it, Chairman? It may, have been put on, it may have been put on the floor and it's put on the floor today again, but I don't recall that the committee took a decision in relation to that. And I think that's I'm not saying it did, Mr Chairman. I'm saying it was put on the floor. Yeah. Well, we have, we have a proposal to that members can bring this to through other other uh, formats and we have a proposal that uh, a counter proposal so i'm going to put those both to a vote um, i'm going to take the first proposal that members disassociate from uh, from the the actions of members of this committee okay your second proposal didn't have a seconder sorry i'm happy to second that i thought that was a good proposal okay thank you 
just a second. Um, I just need to take some procedural fitness maybe in. Just get the voting sheet. Okay. So can I just clarify? Um, <laughs> do, does one counter the other one out? I don't think it does, Chair. Okay. So I, I need clarity as well because disassociating somebody attending a funeral, but you, you have you, it's not illegal to actually go and, and, and in some ways I think what, what's trying to be made, we need to be very careful what we're actually saying here, that you disassociate people from attendance at the funeral could mean that somebody was socially distancing in a correct way or, or is it disassociating from any breaches of the regulations that took place at that, that's why I'm saying we need to be careful what we're actually supporting here so um I, if i could seek clarity on what what is actually what we're just dis disassociating from yes because it is it is very specific and it could be prejudicial and, and we do need to thread very carefully in, in relation to that paula sorry pam um i think that's the exact word the prejudicial part of it and i think that that's why i'm happy more happier to go down this route, route in terms of somebody independent looking at all the facts because i don't have the facts and then leaving it through that sort of standards and i think that that's the prejudicial part that i'm a little bit uneasy with okay Fair I'd indicate it. yes Pam, sorry. Yeah, just to say that i think um the chief environmental officer was very helpful there and he was very very clear and um followed up colin with, uh, he followed up my question um and it was made very clear that if members of the family thought you know were there then that other people who were not members of the family should not have been there, and that was a very clear breach. Or, that's the bit that I make it work. The funeral? For where, where the funeral, the church, the cortege, the oh, graveyard. That's, 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 you know, but I th I th that's I'm not so sure that the regulations do say that. That's why I'm saying referring it on to somewhere would be. Well, that's all part of the funeral. <laughs> well, no, it's not. Yes, go ahead, Pat. Go ahead, Pat. No, I'm just wondering, um, Alan seems to have set himself up some sort of expert. I'm just wondering, could he tell us if someone is standing on the foot and distancing okay. while a funeral passes, old, uh, is there some breach of regulation or guidance or anything else there? No, I don't seem to understand what he's pushing for here. Uh, Pat, I think I'm pushing for public confidence in this committee, and I think that the, uh, the actions of certain people and certainly uh, uh, the debates through the Assembly over the last few days has demonstrated that there's been a serious uh, loss of public confidence, both in the executive uh, and certainly if, if this committee chooses to ignore that, well, that's, that's fine. But I think that there is, there is a, a subject of public confidence here, and, uh, and I think that... Uh, I just simply want to disassociate myself from that, uh, from those actions which have led to this loss of public confidence. Okay. Well, can I, can I just go ahead, Pat? Quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, and I mean, I made this same point in the, I made this same point in the TEO committee yesterday. The, the go. Uh, there's been a lot of hate and a lot of emotion as a result of it uh, on all sides. And the one thing that's going to with public confidence, they are seen to be continually bickering uh, over this. If members are seen to be falling out and constantly disagreeing, it's time, it's time to let this rest. It's time to put it away and move on and deal with the real issues. Uh, and you know, I make I make that plea to everyone here. Let's put it behind us now and move on. on deal with the real issues that people out there want dealt with, and try and restore confidence in all of the institutions. Okay, thank you, Pat. Alan, you you, you said there that you wish to disassociate yourself. In that light, do you do you still want to proceed with a formal? A vote, or do you wish to put on the record your disassociation? Well, I, I think I've put a proposal on the floor, Mr. Chairman, that this committee disassociates itself from the actions of those who attended the funeral and as okay. they may have contributed to okay. possible breaches. And I, have a, I have an indication from Alan, and then I'm going to put that to a vote. Me, me. <laughs> Alex. Alex, sorry, Alex. <laughs> um, no, I think 
for people to get confidence in this committee and the assembly and people who maybe have done something wrong need to accept their faults and apologize uh, i think that's very important as you know we all make mistakes in life um, and whenever i've done something i shouldn't have i've apologized uh, and tried to rectify that uh, and i think others could do with following that example as well thank you Okay, and and I think there have been, you know, there 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 have been numerous issues around all of this. There have been numerous things said. There are numerous things happening, but I do think that it is important in terms of confidence that we do um, that we do work on the issues that, that we we need to work on. But anyway, there's a proposal that we uh, that the committee disassociates itself from the actions of committee members. All those in favour of sir, that proposal? Sir, can you give me the exact wording, please? Alan, can you give us the exact wording? Uh, that this committee disassociates itself from the actions of any members of this committee who attended the funeral. Okay, so that's that's the proposal that we're voting on. All those in favour? I'm not clear. But can you not? Uh, 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 where breaches have been fine, I suppose that's where. Well, the proposal the proposal was was. I'll, I'll I, I think, Mr. Proposal. Chairman, it, 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 I, I'm basing this on. Calm asked the question. The only people entitled to be at that funeral were family. Um, Anybody just, else um, sir, was in breach? Um, um, all you, I, have, I, have put it, I have put it to the vote there. We're in the yeah, process of voting no, We need to move, move on. We have, other, we have other information. So can I just check again who's in, in favour of that proposal? Pam, Alan and Alex. And those against that proposal? So Jerry and Mike, myself, can people on the phone indicate? Uh, Pat? Um, yes, Jerry. And Orlea? Orlea, for or against that? Sorry, I thought it was on the screen there. Yes, I've raised my hand. You raised your hand to indicate that you are for or against the proposal? Against. Okay. So that is four to three on that proposal. The second proposal was that we four to three against it, that proposal. Could it be noted that we actively abstained? Mm -hmm. Okay, and abstentions from Paula and Colin. Yeah. Okay, the other proposal was um, that members, if members have concerns, they raise those within the structures that exist within any other any of the other structures within standards or whatever. That, Colin, can you phrase that for us? Well, I think if there are concern, if the committee has concerns, that it refers them to the standards um, commissioner within the assembly to investigate. Through the chair, we need clarity on that proposal. I don't think there's any if around it. There are obvious concerns by this committee, so. Does that mean, Colin, that sorry through the chair that we have a debate about it? They arrive at that position. You're saying that if the committee has any concerns, they should raise it through. So, should the committee then have a debate on it at some point to arrive at that? Or are you saying if individual members of the committee have any concerns, they I should? Think, well, if that's, if that's what it takes, because from, from a personal perspective, I see a tent at a funeral as being in the church. I don't know if the members were in the church, so I can't refer it on. But and 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 that's it's not that to me. That's where the difference is from 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 your motion because attendance at a funeral to me within my faith means being in the church. I asked the clear question of the uh, environmental officer whether that actually constituted breaking the law. He said that it did, but I don't know if the, I can't refer people for something if I don't know. And, and that's why I'm saying that if maybe if the committee decides that it does know it can pass it on, or if any member in the committee has that information, they can pass it on. But you have to have that knowledge first before you can. Okay. I, well, I, I thought the proposal was the members individually outside of the committee are at liberty to have the, if they have concerns to bring it to to whatever they may see the relevant. Sorry, I, th I thought your proposal was that this committee would refer the matters to the standards commissioner, and that's what I I think. Yeah, well, and that, and that yeah. speaks to what Alan's saying there around trying to restore confidence in the committee. So it's not a foregone conclusion as to what yeah. happened, but to ask them to look at all the circumstances. So it's an, it's a it's a. Um, a proactive approach by this committee to ask the Standards Commissioner to investigate that. I, I'm, I'm happy with that as the interpretation of the proposal that I've made. So it, it would come from this health committee. So but what are we asking the health? What are we asking the Standards Commissioner to? To investigate the conduct of 
two of the health committee members as to whether they, there, there were breaches and, that, and the processes then that the standards commissioner would go through to ascertain. Okay. Um, okay. Those in favour of that proposal? That's Pam, Paula, Alan, Colin and Alex. And those against that proposal? Colin, Jerry, Orlea and Pat. Okay. So that is five in favour, four against and no. Sorry, what are the numbers there, Claire? Five, four, and four against. Okay. Okay, members. Moving on then to the next session, which is correspondence. So, according to correspondence, can I refer members to the correspondence at tab 10 of the pack and table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 10.1? Can I draw members' attention to several items? Item 10.2 is a response from the Minister updating the Committee on the Department's engagement with the College of Paramedics, addressing concerns around aerosol generating procedures and the use of PPE. Uh, any comments in relation to that and in relation to uh, obviously the extensive discussion that we had, we had today? Um, I think we've already agreed that we're writing to the Department in relation to the, the, the follow period, the AGP and the PPE associated with all of that. So I think we're already we're already doing that. So members are content that we write to the department as discussed earlier. Item 10.3 is correspondence from the Minister regarding comments made by a member at last week's briefing from the Minister and CMO. Um, any comments in relation to that, Jay? Sure, yeah. Uh, that was me, obviously. Uh, my wires were crossed last week at the Health Committee and raised information that was inaccurate to the CMO and the uh, Minister, and I've written to him acknowledging that and putting that on record. Okay, thank you. Chair, can I put on the record my apology for calling the management board a cabal? Um, <laughs> it was in the heat of the moment, and I apologise for that. Okay, thank you. Seems to be pouring down. Okay. Okay, Clark, did you... You got that? Okay, are you happy with that? Okay. Okay, moving on then to item 10.5. Um, members, members are content to note both of those items then. Item 10.5 is a response from the Minister regarding the Department's analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on those living with diabetes and the implications for shielding. On the same topic, item 10.24 is a copy of an open letter from Diabetes UK to the Minister for the Economy and the Minister of Health seeking better protection for clinically vulnerable people in the workplace. Uh, are there any comments on that? Sure. Um, I suppose just in relation to the, the first um, response from the department, um, I think it's just a bit disappointing that, that they don't have the information, even at this stage. Um, and I don't know what they need to do in order to gather that information, but I think it is important that, that information is gathered and uh, that we have whatever evidence is out there in terms of <coughs> managing risk around um, those who are more vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. So I don't know whether we go back to the department and ask when the information will be available. I'm trying to remember what they actually said. Uh, whether they gave an indication as to when they would expect to have the information, but I didn't think there was. It wasn't there yet. <coughs> okay. What what uh, memo? What what part of the briefing is that, Pam? Um, that was Papers? That's page one four two. <clears throat> Item ten point three. NHS England indicate to my blah, blah, blah. And what are you proposing, Pam? Well, I just would like to see um, something that, that's telling us that that, that, that information... Oh, sorry, it's, it is saying here the code of death statistics are scheduled to be published summer 2020, so I suppose maybe we just want an update on when they do receive that information, but I think it's vital that, they, that that is received and... and Asked that they would at, forward that information... Well, I think that would be useful so that, so that we can see whatever stats have been gathered because at this time we don't have those stats even though Public Health England must obviously have those stats. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on then to item uh, 10.6 is a copy of the terms of reference of the independent <coughs> review of the circumstances of the RQAA board resignations. Related to this matter, item 10.33 is a copy of a statement by former members of the board of RQAA on the independent review and its terms of reference. Um, now there are significant issues raised there, but I think I think maybe we should go into closed session just to take some procedural advice in terms of how the committee might interact uh, with those terms of reference in, in, in and how we might impact upon that. So I propose we go into closed session to discuss that. Great. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members. So following discussion, it, it has been agreed that we will ask the clerk to draft a letter to to the minister outlining our concerns around the process and around um, the terms of reference and that we will we will then come back to this issue at our next meeting. Our members agreed? Great. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on then, members, through correspondence. So item 10.8 is a departmental response to the committee's request for information on the governance and procedures for the complaints to the health and social care sector and corresponding serious adverse incidents. The letter advises that requirements were relaxed due to the pandemic, but does not refer to suspension of complaints or when investigations might be resumed. So if you recall, members, this correspondence we dealt with on the 18th of June regarding a complaint which had been at that time outstanding after two years. Um, would members be content to write to all of the trusts to inquire about their timelines for addressing complaints, particularly long-standing complaints, or those which were suspended due to COVID-19, that we'd write to all trusts and ask them to update us on, on their timelines in relation to those. Members content? Great. Yeah. Thank you, members. Item 10.15 is a reply from the Committee for Justice regarding enforcement issues in relation to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 5. Um, and the Committee for Justice, you've, you've seen the letter there, but would members be content to forward the information to the Policing Board for their consideration? Great. Yeah. Agreed. Item 10.23 is correspondence from the Registered Childminders branch of Unite the Union, requesting an opportunity to brief a joint health and education committee meeting. Uh, I'd point out this was received before the Minister's announcement on the 30th of June, where he widened access to childcare for all parents. Um, are members content, therefore, to advise that in light of the Minister's announcement, we're content with the written briefing for now? Agreed. Sure. Yeah. Just to say, Chair, I, I met the, the group, I think it was two weeks ago now, and I thought they were quite uh, useful in giving insight to maybe a section of people in the sector who are often overlooked. So I think when possible, meeting them would, would be a benefit to, to the committee. OK. Uh, any other views from members, given that we have, a, we have a written briefing from them? The issue, the issue has moved considerably on, but any other views from members? Chair, I suppose just we could... Be if the clerk could go back to them and, and see whether they still require yeah. the brief given the changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. would everyone agree with that? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Item 10.27 is an invitation from the organisers of Brestival inviting the chair of the Health Committee to chair a policy round table session as part of World Breastfeeding Week. Um, and I'm happy to attend that if members are content. Great. Thank you. Item 10.30 is correspondence from Derry Chamber of Commerce calling for a cross-departmental workshop with local companies to explore the local production and supply of PPE. Um, related to that, there's an item there, 10.31, which is an offer of assistance from a professor of engineering who also supports the local production of PPE. And members may recall that the CMO advised us last week that the department is working with other departments and Invest NA on PPE and local supply chains. Um, so, any comments in relation to that issue? Um, yeah, Chair. Just to say, I think it's uh, I think it's really important that Northern Ireland as a whole does look to see how they can become self-sufficient in in PPE provision. And I think, um, apart from our own needs, it's obviously going to be um, you know a good line of industry uh, given the the worldwide pandemic. But I think it is important that that we're able to source our own supplies locally and and provide employment and use the skills that we have here to so I just support the the, the whole idea behind. Okay, thank you. Yeah I, I think there's fantastic opportunities for Northern Ireland here going forward. 
Uh, I mean, China really did benefit from the pandemic. It started there and they got a lot of benefit, economic benefit uh, of exporting. And a lot of the stuff was below standard, as we subsequently found out. And we know that the product that would be produced locally will be a good product and it will meet all the, all the standards. Um, and, and this is not, people think this is just, you, you know, a two or three month wonder, but the next three, four or five years, people are still going to be, there's going to be a new normal where people are going to be wearing masks and, and uh, dentists will still be wearing their, their PPE. So great opportunities. I think maybe we should, I, I, I haven't read the letter in detail, Mr. Chairman, I have to confess, but that might be one maybe to pass on to the uh, to the Department of Economy or the Minister for the Economy, uh, for, for they may be better placed to, to to follow it up, but with a very strong recommendation from us that you know we are extremely supportive of any initiative along those lines for a number of reasons, not just the economy reasons, but also as a contribution to public health. Yeah, I was just concur with that. I was going to say something similar. Although I was going to suggest the department or the committee of finance because I think procurement is part of finance. Because I think we would we could spend a lot of time working with these people. And at the start, we know it's critical and important that it happens, and then we'll meet them. And at the end of it, go it's critical and important that we do it, and then pass it to you know the committee of finance. So if we could just pass it on to the department that deals with procurement and say that we really think this is something that they should champion and investigate and give real consideration to and meet with. Uh, to see if there's a good way of doing it, but I think we all well rehearsed the need for it, and I think we would just come out of a process the same way, but be four or five weeks down the line. So, yep. and I, I just I just point out to members the actual proposal is around cross departmental workshops. Now, and I actually did mention that at the meeting with the minister and CMO last week, and and, and it, in terms of declaring an interest, I had met with a group from I think from Derry of, of business people. I'm not sure if it's the Chamber of Commerce exactly. Um, I also come from a business background myself in terms of engineering, so, and, and we would have been involved in the tendering process, but found it a hugely difficult process as a small business. So I think there is value for everybody concerned if the department engages with suppliers to say, listen, here's what we need in terms of quantity, in terms of specification, here's how we need the supply line to follow through. So to those small businesses or medium businesses are better able to meet the needs. I think that's of benefit to all concerned. And, uh, sure. Yes, Paul. Just to say, I did have a meeting with uh, the Chamber of Commerce as well on this issue, and I think one of the one of the very vital issues is in terms of procurement. So it's obviously under um, finance, and in where you know if price is the top priority, then Northern Ireland will never be able to compete with China. So it, that's that is obviously a huge issue. So that's yeah. something that needs to take forward. But yeah, and we should, yeah, social value should be taken into account as well. And and, and one of the and security of supply. Probably. I think one of the big lessons I think that we have learned is the the uh, the precarious nature of supply when a pandemic, in particular, you know, epidemics are one thing and they're they're country based or whatever. But pandemics, obviously, that's a huge lesson. And we could be looking at either further surges of this or indeed future totally different pandemics down the line. So I think it is something. So um, would members be content then to forward to certainly the Department of Health? Could we also forward to uh, any, uh, the other two departments, just as information? Yep. OK, members are content. Great. Okay. So are members otherwise content then with the actions as noted in the rest of the correspondence memo there before I go on to table correspondence? Sure. Yes, Arlia? Thank you. It was just it was correspondence 10.7. I think it was, it was after the RQIA, um, just a letter that came in from the Derry Community um, Crisis Intervention Service. Um, I was just wondering if the committee would be content to write off to the Derry and Straban Council um, with their correspondence. I know they've came to the, the all party group on suicide prevention as well, um, just around their, their campaign to keep that, that suicide prevention um, project up and running. So if people would be content with that. Are you proposing that we forward correspondence that we've already sent earlier? Is that what you're... The reply. The reply? Are you proposing we, we forward the reply to Derry? And look at yes, Derry, please. Derry and Omar Council? Derry and Fermanagh, whatever council that is. Are members content with that? Forward that, forward that reply? Thank you. Okay, moving on to table correspondence. And there are four items of table correspondence. Item 10.36 is a reply from the Minister of Health to the committee's query regarding cross-departmental cooperation regarding support for people with visual impairments. Um, could I suggest that we forward the response to the Committee, com committee for Communities? 
for information. Yeah, mm. members content, thank you. Item 10.37 is from the Minister of Health providing a copy of a response sent to an individual who had raised concerns with us in relation to the reopening of childcare facilities. Can I suggest that we forward a copy of that response to the Committee for Education? Yeah. Item 10.38 is a letter from Chris Hazard, MP, in relation to the future of emergency care in the Down Hospital. Um, before seeking comment, I would remind members that we have a protocol here agreed between us on dealing with constituency issues and our agreement to deal with matters in their wider regional context. Um, so that, that we, we only deal with issues where they have a wider context. So any comment or anything members want to say in relation to this item? Chair, of course, I'll <laughs> bounce up and down. I uh, welcome the letter from, from um, Chris, and there is a lot of concern within the community um, in Downpatrick and, and the wider down and Moran area because we were one of only three places in the UK to lose our emergency department as, as a result of coronavirus. Um, and it's set against the backdrop of there being a lot of discussion, especially in leaked reports this week, about the reorganisation um, of emergency departments. And I think maybe I understand the issue of constituency issues and not being able to invite specific constituents issues to, to the committee. But maybe could we get a presentation uh, maybe from the department in terms of that reorganisation of emergency provision? Because Daisy Hill has lost its emergency department, the Down has lost it. Um, and just even if you look at, if you, people can z zoom up and look down in Northern Ireland and just see that County Down has lost essentially its two emergency departments. Um, the Ulster is technically in County Down, but I mean it services Belfast as much as it services County Down. Uh, and we just feel that we've been lost. And I would be very worried about those, that proposal about the five hospitals because you know, to be blunt, the five hospitals that were mentioned has been changed. They can all be accessed within about 25 minutes of each other by the motorway network. And it's those rural communities like the, the Downpatrick and the Down Hospital where you have to travel 25, 30, 40 miles to be able to access um, some form of emergency. And what's happened here is the emergency department was taken away. The suggestion has come back to replace it with a minor injuries unit. The um, trust are not giving an indicative time of when the emergency department will be replaced. They're saying that they might come at the end of July with an indicative time, but there's just an awful lot of confusion, and it's a big area of population that's concerned. But if we take it in the general, which we can address as a committee, could we ask for an urgent um, presentation from the emergency reorganisation? I think there's, there is a review team, and maybe if the clerk could help me, um, uh, emergency services review or emergency... Yeah, the, the, yeah. There was a review of urgent and emergency care was initiated in 2018. Yes, and um, I think it would certainly be relevant to get a, an, a, an, an urgent update. written update in relation to yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and when that report will be will be published, yes. with the was a review. And I think there are broader issues here around the whole issue of co-production, co-design, exactly. involving stakeholders in all of these decisions. Um, I think that's certainly. Do you to say that uh, we have the briefing from? The trust coming up on the twenty third. Would that not be the place to? Which trust is it? Well, I presume what it's all. I don't know which trust, but um, we've already spoken to two of the trusts. I we, think we do. But um, as Colin and the chair have referenced, that review of urgent and emergency care is in development, and while questions could be asked of the trust, certainly um, uh, they may not yet have that review or those conclusions yet whereas an update to the committee might give you some additional information on top of that. Um, would it be a miss as well for the committee maybe just to write to the South Eastern Trust and ask them when they intend to reinstate um, the, the emergency department? Is that something that we can do, just as a written, just to write and ask them to, to, if they could write back to us? And, uh, um, are, are, these, are the trust plans not all available? at this point in time. Um, yeah, and I think the plan... And, and we're looking to go down the line of one constituency, Jerry? Yeah, um, the, OK, maybe in terms of the plans, the plan, uh, it, the Southern Trust has indicated a time for their reintroduction of Daisy Hill, but the South Eastern hasn't for the Down, so it's the only one out of all of Northern Ireland. So we've had the plans, they've put the dates, this is one omission. So maybe be seeking clarification under that regional plan, when do they intend to... 
Well, what I would suggest maybe that you do you do you do that or, or okay. individual members do that. And um, what I do think we should ask in terms of the regional approach, okay. how that's being how that's being taken forward in relation to co-production, co-design, engagement with stakeholders. And I think we could ask them to provide us with a written briefing on that. Okay. Uh, members content with that? Yep. Thank you. Uh, moving on then to the final piece of correspondence then is item 10.39. This is a report from Independent Sage entitled A Better Way to Go Towards a Zero COVID UK. So this is the report that I mentioned earlier that I had attended a round table on during the week. Um, it sets out a number of successes here uh, and, and, and actually it is notable how well we have performed uh, in, in uh, comparison with England and maybe Wales. There's also been a similar type of trajectory in Scotland and in the 26 counties. But the proposal would be, my, my reading, but you, you all have the document there and you can have a look at it. The proposal is that you look at cooperation between the two islands, but also the islands, each of the two islands themselves, need to take decisions that kind of reflect the stage of where they're at, maximises the benefits of being individual islands, and that you all work together to manage the... the the course of the virus in that respect, and that that you seek essentially to eliminate the virus while you will have individual cases, and that that is something that you will need to have a system in place to track and monitor, um, similar to what has been seen in, in New Zealand where cases have arisen, but that your aim is to eliminate COVID-19. And I think that mm -hmm. is an economic imperative as well as clearly a health imperative. Mm -hmm. But that I'm very conscious members haven't had much time to consider that report, but could I propose that we return to that item at the next formal meeting on the 23rd in terms of developing a committee position on next steps in dealing with the pandemic? Members content? Content. Thank you. Okay. Um, before, uh, yeah, well, I'll take the forward work programme there. Item 11, can I refer, refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 11 of the pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to go back then, members. We didn't formally put the uh, issue in relation to the two SRs amendments, number nine and number 10. So I would like now, in relation to amendment number nine, and that was the one just to refresh you, it was dealing with the 30 attending, uh, a third, a crowd, raising from 10 to 30 of out, outdoors. So the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 121, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, Amendment number 9, Regulations, NA 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Are members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The second item then was SR 2020 forward slash 128, which dealt, which dealt with a range of uh, issues around spas and... Uh, um, spas, reopening, massage, tattoo parlours, and funerals not restricted to family and friends. So, can I then ask members that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 128, Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, Amendment Number 10, Regulations 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, members. That brings us on then to any other business. Is there any other business today from members? I uh, see our Leah hand up there. Is that still? Our Leah, you're in it? Yeah, sorry, it was just um, to come in on the obviously yesterday's review that was launched um, around the medicines and medical devices. Um, so it was obviously a significant day for the, the MESH campaign groups. Um, from from the north, and I, w I was hoping that maybe if the committee was content to write off to the minister, um, you know, obviously just um, recognising, you know, the pain, the hurt, and the bravery um, of of all the women from here um, who have campaigned for so long on this issue. Um, it was a good day for them. The recommendations, some of them are are, are pretty pretty strong in relation to an apology in specialist centres and a patient safety commissioner. But I was hoping maybe if we, we can send off a wee form of words just in recognition of, of our women here locally, and then maybe asking the minister for his his response um, to to those those recommendations that have been made. And I also think then it's timely, I know we'll be having the conversation next week around the Fort Work programme, but um, I know at one stage we were talking about doing a, a session with the, the different mesh 
pelvic mesh and hernia mesh, whatever way we're, we're going to work it out to, to bring them in in front of the committee. So, um, but we can talk about that more, more next week. Okay. So members, are you clear enough, Clerk? And are members content with that? Yeah. Content, yeah. 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 Members content. Okay then, members, a uh, final item on the agenda today is date, time and place of the next meeting. The next meeting will be a planning meeting to discuss the committee's forward work programme for the autumn. This will take place at 10.30am on Thursday 16th of July 2020 via um, Microsoft Teams. Okay, thank you members. Thank you. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.